Welcome to Abolition Democracy 413 on the Abolition of Slavery. The last seminar on the abolition of the police and our discussion on policing today, you will recall, was framed by the legacy of the violence and terror that white Americans unleashed on freed black men and women after the Union victory uh, in the Civil War. And even before that, framed by the genealogy of policing that traced in this country, in part to the slave patrols and the policing of racial hierarchy and racial ordering. I mentioned that the brilliant artist Dred Scott had captured our framing of policing by reimagining the flag that flew from the offices of the NAACP in New York City, bearing the words, a man was lynched yesterday, that flag that was flown to mark the incident of a known lynching of a black person between 1920 and 1938. And there were thousands more unknown uh, that have recently uh, been documented, thanks in part to the tremendous work of the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama. Dred Scott repurposed the flag, creating a stunning, <clears throat> shocking statement for our times and capturing the historical trajectory uh, that leads to police killings today. It's such a powerful piece and it captures so poignantly the historical continuities that are at the very heart of this seminar series on abolition democracy. Well, I'm delighted this evening to welcome the artist Dred Scott to present and discuss another of his remarkable uh, artworks. Um, and this one also will frame tonight's discussion of the abolition of slavery. I'm talking about his remarkable slave revolt reenactment project, uh, a reenactment of the largest slave revolt in American history, which took place in 1811 in Louisiana, just upriver uh, from New Orleans. And here uh, represented in another series of his work, uh, a series inspired by the brilliant migration series of Jacob Lawrence. Tonight, we will be discussing the abolition of slavery in relation to our overarching project in this seminar to think through our current, our contemporary abolitionist projects on the prison, on the police, on the death penalty, but also on property and on borders as well. The task tonight is to return to history and to ask, what does the emancipation of slavery and the role in abolition of the persons who were enslaved. What does all this tell us about today's possibilities for abolition and our role in abolition? What do the continuities, what do the differences tell us about possibilities today? In that interrogation, Dred Scott's artwork forms again, the perfect framing, a framing that once again takes me back uh, to W.E.B. Du Bois's uh, foundational text, uh, Black Reconstruction in America. So once again, I want to start with a passage, uh, this one from page uh, 121 uh, of Du Bois's uh, magnum opus, where he writes, <clears throat> it was not the abolitionist alone who freed the slaves. The abolitionists never had a real majority of the people in the United States back of them. Freedom for the slave was a logical result of a crazy attempt to wage war in the midst of four million black slaves and trying the while sublimely to ignore the interests of those slaves in the outcome of the fighting. Yet these slaves had enormous power in their hands. Simply by stopping work, they could threaten the Confederacy with starvation. By walking into the federal camps, they showed to doubting Northerners the easy possibility of using them as workers and as servants, as farmers and as spies, and finally, as fighting soldiers, and not only using them thus, but by the same gesture, depriving their enemies of their use in just these fields. It was the fugitive slave who made the slaveholders face the alternative of surrendering to the North or to the Negroes. It was this plain alternative that brought Lee's sudden surrender. Now, Du Bois ties this argument uh, to the idea of the general strike, uh, which was important to him given his collectivist uh, political beliefs. Uh, the labor struggles in the late 1920s and the 1930s, when he was writing Black Reconstruction, 
were of central importance to him. The notion of abolition democracy was tied for Du Bois to his ongoing struggle for social and economic justice. So the framing of the general strike, which indexes workers' movements, was key. The contemporary for Du Bois was key, just as it is for us, uh, as we too might think about the idea of a general strike in the context of our uh, current political crisis. Uh, including the attempted coup that President Trump and the Republican Party are trying to figure out uh, how to carry out uh, as we speak. Now, one central thrust of Du Bois's writings, and this intersects perfectly with Dred Scott's work and helps frame our discussion tonight, was to demonstrate that abolition was achieved through the actions of black men and women through escape, uh, to fight in the ranks of the Union Army, uh, through the general strike, uh, through the threat threat of the general strike, through forms of resistance, through their presence as the primary force that fueled the Southern economy. The enslaved women and men, in his words, decided the war, despite the South and despite the North. And in this seminar, we turn to interrogate these lessons, lessons about the abolition of slavery and what they might teach us today in our struggles for abolition democracy. We'll begin then with an intervention by the remarkable artist, Dred Scott, uh, Dredd is an interdisciplinary artist and his work uh, really encourages us to re-examine and to question uh, our ideals and our beliefs. Uh, so much so, in fact, that in uh, 1989, the U.S. Senate outlawed his artwork and President Bush declared it disgraceful. And this was in connection with the transgressive use of the American flag. Of course, that was long before the thin blue line American flag became so prevalent, in fact, and now flies behind uh, Republican candidates. Uh, Dred Scott's work has been widely exhibited around the country and around the world uh, at the Whitney Museum, uh, MoMA, PS1, at the Walker Art Center, and in galleries and on street corners. He'll be discussing his reenactment project, uh, which was highlighted by Artnet.com in 2019 as one of the most important artworks of the decade. Uh, and his artwork has been extensively covered by The Guardian, The New York Times, Vanity Fair, and many other publications, major publications. Now, uh, after that presentation, we will then have a panel of historians and African-American literature and ethnic studies scholars to help us think through the continuities and the differences, the ways in which the abolition of slavery can shed light on our current abolitionist efforts, our efforts for racial justice. Uh, I will invite my colleague, uh, Professor Maeve Glass, to kick off the discussion. Uh, she helped me curate this panel and uh, I'm deeply grateful to that, uh, for that. Uh, Maeve Glass is a legal historian in the United States who examines the development of constitutional law and its implications today, uh, and is a professor here at Columbia. She's currently completing her first book, These United States, The Fracturing of America, which explores how the United States became a nation of co-equal states. She's, been, she's held fellowships at Columbia, Harvard, and NYU, and she's received awards from the American Society for Legal History for her work on the history of state citizenship, as well as from the National Institute of Military Justice for her work on the history of military commissions. Uh, after she opens and frames uh, our discussion, we will then hear from Stephanie Jones Rogers. Uh, welcome, Stephanie. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Stephanie Rog Jones Rogers is a professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, her research focuses primarily on gender and American slavery. Uh, her first book, uh, which was titled, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South, is a regional study that draws upon formerly enslaved people's testimony uh, to dramatically reshape current understandings of white women's economic relationships to slavery. Uh, she is currently working on her next two books, uh, Woman of the Trade, uh, which reorients uh, our understanding of the British Atlantic slave trade by centering the lives and experiences uh, of English, African, and Afro-English women, free and captive. Uh, and a second book, well, or third book, uh, Women, American Slavery, and the Law, which will examine the relationship between gender and the evolution of American slave property law in both the North and the South from the colonial period to slavery's legal end. Uh, after uh, Stephanie, we will then hear from Dennis Childs. I'm delighted to welcome Dennis to, the, to this evening's panel. 
Uh, Dennis Childs is a professor of African American literature and an affiliate faculty member of the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, he is the author of Slaves of the State, Black Incarceration from the Chain Gang to the Penitentiary, a uh, few chapters of which uh, we, we all read, uh, as well as Stephanie's work. Um, uh, that book, Slaves of the State, is a work that deals with the connections and the continuities uh, between chattel slavery and prison slavery from the late 19th century uh, through to the prison industrial complex. Uh, as a scholar activist, uh, Dennis Childs has worked with various social justice organizations, including the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, uh, All of Us or None, and uh, the Chicano Mexicano Prison Project. And uh, he is a community advisory board member for critical resistance. So let me turn it over to you then first, Dred, to discuss uh, your brilliant reenactment project. And um, I'm hoping that you'll be able to uh, share your screen and, uh, uh, and take it away. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks. for having me. And um, yeah, I will just get into it. The introduction was great. And so without wasting any time, I'll just jump into sharing my screen and talk about slave rebellion reenactment. Um, let's see. So, um, yeah, and actually just before jumping in on that, I wanted to say one thing, the, the image that you showed of the screen print that was uh, related to um, uh, oh, Jacob Lawrence was actually a inspired by a project he did on Toussaint Louverture, actually. Oh. Um, the Migration Series is his best known series and it's really great, but he did a whole project on Toussaint Louverture, the leader of the Haitian Revolution. And, um, yeah, so anyway, um, Slave Rebellion Reenactment was a community engaged project that uh, was presented to the public in November of last year, just about a year ago, November 8th and 9th. Um, and it was a reenactment of the largest rebellion of enslaved people in the history of the United States. Um, as Bernard said, I'm a visual artist. And so we, while I do have feet in a couple different camps, including that of activism, the approach to this was not just a traditional, like, let's do reenactment. It was actually to do it as a fine artwork. Um, and it was community engaged. So this is a, a map that actually shows the just general area that the reenactment took place in. We started about 35 miles upriver from the heart of New Orleans, the city itself, which was in the exurbs and suburbs. Um, we started in a town called Laplace and we marched along uh, River Road, which meandered along the Mississippi River down to a town called Kenner, um, which was just outside or which is the, the town where the, the uh, airport is. So if you are from New Orleans or happen to travel there, that's the route that we marched for part of it. Um, but this was a community engaged project. It wasn't mostly about say hiring a bunch of actors to, to be reenact this history. It was a long-term project that took about six years to do. And a lot of that involved meetings with just all, all sorts of ordinary New Orleanians and people around the country, but mostly in New Orleans and the, and the surrounding suburbs to talk with them about this history, to talk with them about why, to have conversations with 21st century people about why this 19th century history of freedom and emancipation matters and to get them to want to welcome this project and participate in it in some ways. And so we had lunches and dinners and conversations and fora. Um, I met with students from the Black Student Union of Tulane University, which is a pr predominantly white school, but there's a, several black uh, students that are part of the Black Student Union there. Um, I met with students from Dillard and, and Xavier. Xavier was a real base and those are Dillard and Xavier are both historically black colleges in the area. Um, and talk with them about participation. And this is a woman who you might have seen from the two slides previous that that was at one of the, the dinners. And a couple of years later, she became the assistant project manager, Shanna Griffin. She's a brilliant, radical woman um, and really became an anchor for the project in the area. Um, with deep roots and connections to the people of the community, various communities there and, and provided some entree into those communities for the project to be successful. When we talk about doing a project of, you know, reenactment of enslaved people, we actually had to come up with costumes and we wanted to make the costumes both historically accurate, but also one do it in a way that would give enslaved people back their humanity. And so typically, if you think about well, what did enslaved people wear, not that people think about that that much, but if you do, a lot of times, they, oh, they wore burlap sacks or something like that, cheap clothing. And you know, and part of that, if you look at even the 1977 version of Roots, you'd see a lot of that. But the, the thing is, when we wanted to try and get what was accurate, we looked at um, the costume department, looked at, at lithographs and, and paintings and drawings from 
largely sort of the regions of where French colonial slavery existed. So Guadeloupe, Martinique, Saint-Domingue, which became Haiti. And we noticed that, you know, there were pictures of men in turbans. And we thought, well, wait a minute, these are people from West Africa. It's hot there. And one of the styles of dress is turbans. We also looked at the various colors and noted that since it was French colonial slavery at about the same period, that the the clothing might be similar. We also looked at runaway slave ads because if you believed you owned a person and you wanted them back, you would describe very accurately what they were wearing when they left. And so it was not burlap sack, burlap sack. It was all sorts of variety of clothing. And so the costume department designed clothes and then we had sewing circles because again, this was a community engaged project. We didn't want to just, A, we couldn't just go to a costume house and rent them because the, the, nobody had actually done a project like this that was very specific to the period of 1811 around New Orleans and, and a French colonial society of, of, of enslavement. And so, but we also wanted to provide access for people who wanted to participate in the project in a range of ways. So we had professional seamstresses, but we also had people who were gonna participate in the, the two day reenactment, which covered 26 miles over the course of two days. And, you know, on the right, you see a man named Sly Watts. He learned to sew that day and was starting to help make his own costume. People around the country and around the, you know, in the, the New Orleans suburbs connected with this. Some people either because they were white or because they were, were older or felt they couldn't walk the, the, the distance, contributed by making costumes and people as far away as Chicago and Oakland also made costumes. We did walking practice um, because we knew that we probably were not as strong as enslaved people in the, the uh, early 1800s and we wanted to see whether we could indeed walk 13 miles a day and we also wanted to check out and we went to the small towns whether or not there would be dogs that would be off the leash that might attack us. Fortunately that wasn't the case and fortunately we found that we could actually walk some distance um, and we had conversations again about why this history mattered and how do you embody freedom and emancipation and bring this sort of history to the present. Um, we had to make flags because we know that in 1811 that the enslaved marched under banners um, at the time, the, the, the general, General Wade Hampton, wrote to the governor, Governor Claiborne, and said there are 500 brigands in the field and marching in formation under flags. So that gave us both a size of the, the rebel army, but also we knew that they were disciplined, that they were in formation marching with flags, but they didn't bother to write down what the flags were. So we had to imagine what they might be um, and what would people who sometimes in say the Asante kingdom or regions of West Africa that might've been literally at war with each other, how would they unite themselves? And so this this is somewhat imagined. This is an Adinkra from uh, Ghana um, and it means uh, hope and confidence. Um, often in, in slave rebellions, we've, we've found that uh, often there would be a flag that would say liberty or death or death or liberty. This is uh, uh, Louisiana Creole. It's not misspelled French. It's not a typo. Um, and French would have, and French Creole would have been the, the dominant language there. And this is a, a flag that would, a board, uh, Ogun sword, a Gu sword. Um, people, if they were Yorubas or uh, perhaps Congolese, which there were a lot of Yorubas and, and Congos in the uh, region of that were enslaved in the New Orleans area. And Gu Sword Gu was a warrior uh, Orisha that um, people would have been following. And so we were trying to imagine what might unite people across differences and what, what flags they might've had. We also had to learn to walk like an army. I mean, it's not enough to have really great costumes. We actually had to have people look like they would be disciplined because it actually was part of bringing forward that this was a, a conscious, intentional, liberatory vision because part of the thing was the the idea of the enslaved in 1811 was not just to fight back it was not just to escape and form a maroon colony or escape for themselves it was actually to overthrow the system of enslavement and set up an african republic in the new world it was a bold vision of freedom and emancipation where they wanted to seize all of orleans territory which is modern day louisiana so we wanted to in in our presentation of this actually exude that this was a, a an intentional discipline thing that was going up against a, a, a organized army. Um, but it, again, this a lot of it was about what people who were embodying this history thought. So this is a brief sort of look into conversations with some of the people who were considering whether they wanted to participate in, in this project. Recruiting others into it. Why would you, you know, a 21st century guy, want to go walk 26 miles in some French colonial clothing? Because this crazy guy named Dre Scott asked me to do it. <laughs> the idea of people coming together to pool their energy in that way, I feel like we really need that. This is the closest that I'll ever be able to come to experiencing what my ancestors experienced. I'm surrounded by comfort. 
So what happens if I eliminate all that and just the only connection that I have is with the people and the purpose. It's important for this generation to know that you're not the descendants of slaves, you're descendants of people that were enslaved and you're at your current position because of the resistance. To know that your ancestors fought is enough to build up a sense of dignity for a child. So like if people do know about this history, I think it'll spark rebellion in people today. People are reevaluating the position of black people in American society in a way that they haven't for about 40 years. And it's not just for black people. This is a question of people who wish to be free from this oppressive society. So these are some performance stills to give you a sense of what, what slave rebellion reenactment actually looked like if you were an audience member or if you were a participant. And looking at this, a lot of times when people talk about reenactment, a lot of, if you think of Civil War reenactment, they want to excise the modern. They want to sort of pretend it's almost like a Hollywood set and say, this is exactly how things were in 1862 or something like that. And as a visual artist, I'm much more interested in this, how, exploring how the past both sets the stage for the present, but also how it exists in the present in new form. And so this image, which actually shows this army of the enslaved marching against the backdrop of modern day Louisiana, this is past the, the oil refinery of Norco in Cancer Alley, is actually what is sort of the heart of the project, this sort of temporally out of place slave army talking about the past and talking about the present at the same time. And this is once we've arrived into the city of New Orleans, And so this was a project that was about black joy, about liberation and freedom. It was not a project about slavery. It's about liberation and freedom. And as I think you could see in this image and in some of these videos, but also one I'll show in a bit, this was really about black joy. And so this is how we arrived in Congo Square at the end of it, which is a place that was historically important for the preservation of black and African culture. Um, and just want to read two quotes from people and then show one 30 second video and then we can have a conversation. So when I was tasked to kill one of the slave owners on the levee, as an indigenous woman, Choctaw and Creole, it was especially hard because I had to really dig deep down and force myself to feel the inherited trauma from both sides of my family to fully appreciate the gravity of the situation. And I felt like I finally got a chance to represent somebody who most people may not even know exists. And this question of presenting somebody who most people might not know exists has everything to do with whether people get free now. And it's not just about the past, but if you don't think that people were resisting enslavement, you actually might have a harder time thinking about getting free in the present. Um, this is just showing that this project now lives in museums. It was covered in Vanity Fair and on CNN, which was really great. So it goes from the streets into museums, but also into popular culture. And this is the final video I want to show. Liberty! 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 And so that's that's it. That's Slave Rebellion reenactment in a nutshell. Amazing, amazing work, Dred. Really amazing work. I mean, the the juxtaposition of the reenactment with those uh, with the with the petrol uh, refineries behind him is just is it's the shock. It's the it's that contrast that in your work also. I mean, with the flag as well, right? It's the it's the contrast of the present with the past and yes. confronting that is so powerful. It seems to me. Um, 
Uh, so, um, so the amazing work. And, and, and it must have been such an incredible experience for uh, the folks who were participating on this reenactment. I saw you in many of the images as well. So you were, you were participating as well, I take it? Yeah, no, I, I participated and, you know, it's, it's, it, it, performance artists doesn't always have to be in their work, but it, you know, when we can, it, often we do, because there is a real thing. It's, it's not like acting. It's a, a live experience that you get when you're in the midst of doing it and, and you don't know what's going to happen because you've never done it before. And so it was important for me to be part of it. Um, and also to undertake the risks that everybody was, that I was asking people to undertake. I mean, this was, you know, we, we, went through a great deal of effort to ensure people's safety, but we were actually literally marching through clan country and, right. and, and had to, and it was difficult. I mean, it was cold, it was a long walk. And so I, you know, I didn't want to ask people to do something I wouldn't do, but yeah, it was, it was profoundly powerful because as performance art, again, this, the reenactors were an audience for the project too. And it was the trial, the durational aspect, the difficulty. I mean, this was not, we, we all knew that we were going to live through it. We didn't actually have a literal army that was hunting us down and trying to kill us that we were hoping to fight and defeat and liberate ourselves and our family and our friends. But it was difficult because, you know, most, I mean, I, I've never walked a half marathon twice in, you know, in a row and, and slept outside in 40 degree weather. And, you know, so it, it was, you know, feeling it in, in your body and actually seeing how strong and resilient sort of our ancestors were not necessarily literal ancestors, but the, you know, it's like the, what people were able to, the vision they had, but the strength they had, the resilience they had to be able to do this was amazing. And so people participating had this tremendous, but particularly by the time we got to New Orleans, it was a sense of euphoria, but it was euphoria as embodying this army of the enslaved, a liberating army that said, we're going to end slavery. And it was both a call to the past, but it was also a talking about the present. And it was, you know, we brought basically an army of black and indigenous people into a major metropolitan city, which that's cool. Right, right, right. And I mean, the the Guardian did a really excellent job of, in, in its reporting on it, because in part, they spoke with a lot of the people who were um, participating. Yeah. And, 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 and who spoke about how formative it was for them to experience this. Um, uh, the young man who uh, was uh, horse riding and yeah. uh, who, who had that as a passion and who had never realized the connection, right? And uh, or the others, the young woman who hadn't really, who hadn't, who really was coming to terms in a way with history, uh, with living, living through it in that way. Um, yeah, no, the Guardian piece is really great, and I'm really happy that they they did that. I mean, it's it's you know a, a really great sort of seven minute synopsis of the project and the, talking with people, the people that were the reenactors. That's the heart of the project. I mean, it's not you know Dred Scott artist, master artist, genius vision or anything. It's all these people that participated and made the project their own, and and both learned something, but also brought a tremendous amount to it. I mean, the people that I met, you know, that, I mean, this one woman like you know drove like eight hours each way to kind of do the the training for it and she was gonna drive back the night that she came so she was gonna come um do the rehearsal for firing these like dangerous outdated weapons even though it was you know it's just gunpowder it wasn't any shot but we had to have training so she drove eight hours from Tallahassee was gonna drive back the same night because she couldn't afford to stay sort of overnight uh, and we 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 did find a place for her to stay so she didn't have to do that but in talking with her i found out that her great 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 grandmother was a, a one of the participants in the original rebellion there were people that were virtually homeless who were participating and you know they they sometimes acted as movie actors extras and this was such a different experience because we treated them like human beings. She, they, they said, look, like when we're on movie sets, it's just like we're objects, we're chairs, but you are, I mean, you're the director of this and you're talking with us and having lunch. So there was this whole way in which for all, all sorts of, or, I mean, there, there, you know, there was somebody who was a former, formerly in prison just, and he got out about six months before. And he said, look, I used to be in prison and now I'm embodying somebody who's free. It was so meaningful to him. And there's all these kinds of stories. And, and I mean, in the Guardian, they talked to the, the aunt and uncle of, of Oscar Grant, who was, you know, murdered by the police in, in the Bay Area Rapid Transit, you know, shot handcuffed face down um, in on January 1st, 2009. And, you know, it was one of the first actual 
cell phone coverages of the police executing and murdering somebody. Um, and so they flew from Oakland to be part of this. And so it, it was just, I mean, it was so meaningful for the, the reenactors. I mean, for the audience who saw it, it was really great, but for the reenactors, it was this whole, you know, way to connect to this past and actually embody and live it in the present. And it was, it was really tremendous. Right. And one of the things that kind of really puts a, a highlight on, right, is the in, is visibility and invisibility in history. I mean, what is what 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 has been memorialized, what is hidden by history, <laughs> what's buried, what's excluded. Yeah. So the work, your work with kind of creating creating flags, right? I mean, creating the imagery that would potentially would possibly have been there, but that is not recorded. That no one, yeah. no one has any idea of what it really was anymore. And um, we read for tonight this this uh, brilliant piece by Sadia Hartman, who's a colleague here at Columbia, and where she uh, Venus and Two X, where she talks about this, the, 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 how the archives are hidden, the archives of of the of the experience of the of the person who was enslaved or in, in transit or in the Middle Passage is. It's just hidden that there's just a few clues and you had a few clues right you had the clue yeah. that there were there were flag they were on marching under banners but you didn't have the flag itself and yeah. so um Sidia hartman talks about it through this idea of critical fabulation mm. uh, which is it's just kind of like creating a, a a record from from the few pieces that exist and in part i think you were doing that right yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it, it was interesting. I mean, one of the scholars that I consulted with is Vincent Brown, who's who's at Harvard, and and, and one of the things he's a real expert of of specifically the uh, uh, Tacky's Revolt in in 1760 and 1761 in Jamaica, um, but he's really thinks a lot about slave rebellion. And one of the things he talks about in in how how he visualizes and thinks about presenting history is that there there's a lot that we don't. No, but the way it often gets told by historians, it codifies it in a way that removes, say, some of the dynamism of, of rebellion or something like that. And in consulting with them, I said, look, there's some thing, decisions I'm going to have to make because I actually have to physicalize this that are speculative. And since I'm an artist, I don't have the same responsibility in a certain sense that historians do, where I have the freedom to make things up where historians can't. But in talking, it was this thing of, well, the speculative nature of what I was doing was actually filling in some gaps. Now, you know, is there any certitude about exactly what happened? No, but this question of the experience of people, the flag, you know, just thinking, well, there had to have been flag. There isn't a lot, a lot of writing about that, but then there could be further research that, because again, I'm not a historian, but historians could go back into that. There was a historian that was there that works at the Whitney Plantation, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Asek, and he's a, a Senegalese Francophone scholar and knows a lot about that enslavement and slavery in in the New Orleans region, and you know one of the things he said is there's there's a third tribunal record that is somewhere we don't know where it is, but there were there were three tribunals that happened after this rebellion was put down, and so you know the speculative nature of this is prompting historians like that to say well let's actually go make sure we can unearth that if it still exists maybe it's in you know just some city or or county or parish record somewhere, or maybe it's been destroyed. But but the fact that there are now scholars that are thinking about this history and the speculative questions that we we imagined actually lead to, to generative thought that people might be able to say, well, let's go in and then see what's really true. But the, the just mere thing of like having to decide, well, where was a battle and what would you have had to take in with you and how quickly could you leave all those things that we had to decide again with a lot of artistic license, but they do point to questions that people would have, you know, had to had to have solved and thought about and did solve in 1811. Right, but actually, a bit, and 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 actually, I mean, what's so fascinating about that is how enriching the artistic experience of having to reenact some an event like the slave revolt could be. To the historian, in other words, I mean, because because you know, it's in the in the act of in the act of reenacting, all of a sudden you have to ask questions about. Well, wait a minute, how did they get from here to there? Yeah. You know, yeah. what what exactly? You know, in a, in a in a concrete material, you know, in terms of lived experience, that then can kind of reframe exactly what it is that the historian needs to find, or or or, or all of the dimensions of kind of the the experience of right um yeah. so so it has a 
beautiful connection of the kind of the artistic performance and creativity as uh, providing some structure, depth, dimensions, multiple dimensionality for the archivists to then kind of try and flesh it out, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So, and so this ties perfectly into, I mean, and so some of our, and so we have historians and African-American literature uh, scholars right now, and, and I'm gonna move the conversation there because it ties perfectly to exactly what uh, is, is being done and, and what Maeve Glass uh, is, wrote about in her post for the seminar today, which is kind of uh, chain, refocusing, finding these uh, missing pieces that have been kind of buried in history, uh, sometimes because there's no archive, sometimes because there's a there was a, a, a racist historiography that buried the the place of the black abolitionists uh, in the story of uh, abolition, in the story of reconstruction, or, or as we know, tragically, uh, you know, Columbia University's role in actually kind of uh, uh, intentionally burying uh, reconstruction uh, with the school of Histori history that was here. Uh, after the war. Um, but so, so I think that w w this is the perfect segue then to go to our uh, historians uh, to hear from them about uh, these questions. Uh, Dred, I hope you're gonna, you'll stay on. And yeah, of course. you're next from uh, Maeve. Uh, if you wanna turn on your video, Maeve, I, I know also you're gonna have a presentation um, and then maybe you can start the conversation uh, from the uh, historian's perspective. So, um, hi. Thanks for joining us. And um, you you also wanted to put on a, a, a few slides. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and, and, and do that or yes. Okay, that looks like that's perfect. Um, all right, so uh, take it away, Maeve. And uh, I'm gonna run into the classroom while you start. Great. Is everything going okay? Yeah, so actually, Afana, if you could just go back to the last screen. Uh... Great. So what we've just read uh, is the beginning of a speech delivered by the abolitionist Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. When she finished the speech that began with the passage that we just read, uh, someone who was in the room later recalled how her words brought people to their feet and made the room sound like thunder. Um, these were words that were spoken by a woman who was told that she was not a citizen of the United States by the Supreme Court. And yet they were words that still traveled through the air and landed in ink on print. They were recorded in shorthand by a man who would become the official reporter of the New York Superior Court. Her words later appeared in a newspaper read by thousands. Uh, these were words that formed part of a broader corpus of abolitionism in the age of slavery. This was a strand of abolitionism that set out to name and record the atrocities of an institution that continues to defy the reach of the traditional lexicon of slavery in academia. This was a mode of abolitionism that focused not on the search for individual rights as the lodestar of transformational change, but on laying bare the wrongs committed by the American state while laying blame squarely at the heels of the court systems and the legal justice, a legal system uh, that in the name of neutrality uh, and legal positivism advanced the interests of those who bore the privileges of whiteness. Although the words of abolitionists like Watkins Harper 
uh, were once transcribed with the same care as a judge, uh, once broadcast in newspapers across the country. Uh, her words would, by the end of the 19th century, soon disappear into the archives that we were just talking about. Uh, in its place, a history of abolitionism would come to the foreground that effectively erased those stories that Watkins Harper had begun with. Instead, this was a history that focused on the deeds and limitations of white abolitionists who were unwilling or unable to challenge the status quo upon which they benefited. We of today live in an age where owing to the work of historians of abolitionism and slavery, uh, the words that Watkins Harper spoke that day have once more come to the foreground, giving rise to a new set of questions for lawyers and activists as to what that history, now that it's been uh, illuminated once again, made newly visible, what that history can teach us about the past and whether uh, and what's at stake in even asking the question about finding a usable past. So in the time that I have this evening as a way of uh, framing uh, the, the, the conversations, um, I wanted to explore this particular question by, by returning to this text that, that Watkins Harper left us with. And I wanted to ask in particular, what was it uh, that she hoped her audience would hear? Why did it resonate in 1858? Where did it come from? Um, and why did it disappear? And what in this moment of recovery can we learn? So what was the message? Where did it come from? Where did it go? And what can we learn from it today? So let's begin then with the message itself. What might the author of this text have hoped that her audience would hear? And if we return once more to the starting point, the frame of analysis and consider the divergent strands of abolitionism that were in play in 1858, we can see right off the bat that there were multiple ways with which one could begin to form the abolitionist critique against slavery. Um, by 1858, there was at least two among a multitude of ways that one could string words together to try to persuade someone to act. The first uh, and perhaps the most well-known was the long and storied tradition of speaking about the individual rights of a black person as a citizen of the world and as a citizen of the nation. This was a form of discourse that had traced its roots back to the age of revolution. It appeared in petitions submitted to Congress in 1790, 1797. It sounded in David Walker's appeal and it echoed in responses to the Dred Scott decision, insisting on the founding promises of a nation. Then too, there was a second discourse that focused not on the rights of the individual that ostensibly derived from natural law and codified into the founding documents, but rather a discourse that looked to the rights of states. This was a more recent vintage argument, one that emerged in the 1830s when white abolitionists in Boston uh, began the work of subtly transforming the issue of black rights to one of states' rights recognizing that appropriating that language of the individual rights of a black person was not going to carry weight in an instant in a country embedded and wedded to the institution of slavery and the ideologies of white supremacy upon which it rested. In that moment, the transformation that began led by the Garrisonians and others, Wendell Phillips, sought to develop a discourse that would become seized upon by anti-slavery politicians who would insist on the halls, on the stairs leading to the Capitol, uh, that none could interfere with the institution of slavery in a union predicated on the promise of co-equal states. And so if we think back to that moment in 1858, um, we can see these two opportunities to talk about the individual rights derived from that founding moment, we could think about the arguments based on states' rights and argue that the Constitution was uh, grounded in slavery and bring to bear the deeds of the founders as the central site of inquiry. And yet the author of our text did neither. Um, recall the opening image. We begin with an army, an army that is rising in the country that is engaged in a struggle for which our neat units of political time and space disappear. This is a struggle that expands beyond the unit of the nation, expands beyond the temporal entities of the country. 
Instead, by shifting the focus to focus on that army rising up in the land, those who were engaged in the struggle, the long and weary struggle, we see a transformation in the topic of conversation. We're no longer talking about the founding moment and the meaning of the constitution. We're talking about the words and stories recorded by those who are in the army of the living and the dead. We see and we hear the stories shift from conversations of wrongs done to under the banner of states' rights to focus on the materiality of the trauma and the pain wrought by the relentless and systematic taking of Black lives and Black property. Think of the right of possession that we close with in that opening passage. This was a record that came not from rehashing the debates again and again over what the founders may have thought or not thought about the institution of slavery, but that recentered the focus to the humanity that had been lost and the struggle for resistance that was ongoing. By shifting that focus, uh, this was a line of abolitionism that sought to give voice and amplify the words of refugees, the words of those who were making their way out on, on, on the roads that were uh, impossible to determine if you were in the free state or a slave state. By taking those stories and foregrounding them, this was a form of abolitionism that sought to reframe and reground by creating a record of wrongs and laying the blame not with the deeds of distant founders, not with one-off plantations that could be shuttered in the Civil War, but something far more systemic, far more embedded. The very system of law that claimed that under the banner of legal positivism, under the banner of neutrality and objective rules, uh, that was the role of the court. That shift in focus then brought the lines of accountability to bear on the immediacy of the actors who were sitting in the Supreme Court making the decisions as opposed to those uh, distant individuals on plantations, distant individuals who had drafted the constitution. So where then did this indictment go? This frame, shift in frame that took us into uh, the the efforts to recover and create a record of the stolen humanity wrought by a system uh, of law. The, the short answer uh, is that we still have this record, this record that was so carefully preserved, not only in transcribed speeches, but in journals and letters in family heirlooms. That record still exists, but those who were charged with telling the history uh, opted not to tell the story, a history that might as well have been written in the sky and yet submerged beneath the rise of a new form of study of law beginning in the 1890s with the emergence of new modern research universities, uh, a new school of lawyers and pol political scientists and constitutional historians begin to erase the storyline that had been offered up in that speech. Instead, the history of abolitionism became that which we, the dominant story uh, was that of focusing on uh, the small cohort of white Northern liberals and erasing that longer history. So what then do we gain by re-listening to those words that have never gone away? I think we can take at least three, three lessons. Um, the first, is the most, probably the most basic, is to recognize that that work of record keeping was a vital part of abolitionism, that it wasn't only about arguing for rights, it wasn't only about contesting uh, the status quo, it was a vision of intergenerational change that rested on keeping a record that would restore the dignity of those who have been denied personhood in the face of the injustice. Second, by recovering that strand of abolitionism that focused on the record keeping, it reminds us that any efforts to try to tell the history of abolitionism today require a full engagement with those atrocities of enslavement that were so impart imparted within the record. We run a risk, I think, by telling stories of abolitionism that don't begin uh, and grapple with the rootedness and the systemic totalizing nature of the challenge that the abolitionists were trying to take on. Uh, third, 
And finally, it may be then that this record of wrongs is as vital to amplify today as the struggle for rights. That now as we try to read the reconstruction amendments for clues as to what they can tell us about a more capacious understanding of rights, it behooves us to listen to that army it behooves us to listen to those who try to record those stories and recognize that the constant vision of changing the constitution with an amendment will be nothing without addressing the fundamental wrongs that precipitated the injustice in the first place. Thank you, Maeve. Um, that was uh, brilliant and uh, it raised for me some fascinating questions about those two discourses and why in fact, uh, what would be the kind of the political economy of those two discourses. And so I'm hoping that we'll come back to that uh, when we're uh, all together. Uh, but this idea that, you know, the, the rights discourse, which is the discourse that then becomes associated with abolition and that becomes associated with the way that we talk about these issues today would take preference over much more of a violent war metaphor right um, and 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 what what why that would be what what purposes does that serve and, and in part that ties nicely to Dennis Child's discussion uh, later on at least in the in 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 his writings about the way in which the turn to say the criminal law uh, becomes this anchor that, that be, be, the myth of legal liberalism or the rule of law serves as the anchor to then allow for exceptions uh, and to uh, recreate a racial hierarchy. But so, so, um, so thank you for that. Uh, really brilliant and um, really important to kind of put, put the finger on this uh, hidden missing discourse uh, and, and, and to ask the question of what, why would it have been kind of buried, right? What were all of the motivations? So we'll come back to that um, when we get to the discussion and I'm looking forward to that. Um, let me ask Stephanie uh, now to uh, join us. Uh, Professor Jones Rogers, thank you for joining us. Um, and so uh, you've done some extraordinary work also on unearthing uh, histories um, and also thinking about the implications for today. So let me turn it to you uh, and your presentation, thanks. Thank you. So thank you so much, Bernard, for first inviting me to be a part of this really important conversation. I'm thrilled to be a part of this. And also for the, the folks that are watching, um, thanks so much, too, for um, sharing um, your time uh, with, with me and with us. Um, Thursday, you could be doing so many things <laughs> right now. And so I'm very appreciative that you're here, here with us. So in my brief comments this evening, um, I will, of course, discuss the abolition of slavery, um, as I've been called upon to do. But I'd like to begin by discussing discussing what slavery was. Not slavery's legal or philosophical definitions, but how enslaved people experienced it at the granular level. Enslaved and formerly enslaved people defined slavery as a system created and sustained by theft. Um, they frequently delineated the various forms uh, which that theft assumed. White men and women's theft of black family members and the black familial separation, which typically occurred when white people decided to sell them or bequeath them, loomed large in the interviews which the federal government conducted with slavery survivors in the 1930s and 1940s. One particularly egregious dimension of this theft, which I explored in my book, They Were Her Property, was white women's decisions to separate enslaved mothers from their children so that these women could serve as wet nurses for their white infants. These women's decisions not only led to the separation of enslaved mothers from their children, their choices led to the theft of enslaved women's breast milk too. According to formerly enslaved women and men, White women frequently used enslaved women to wet nurse all of their children, even when no known ailment prevented them from doing so themselves. Mary Kinchy and Edwards, for example, nursed all of her owner's children. So the white mothers in these women's lives uh, regularly charged them with caring for their white infants and children at the expense of their own. Abolition should have been remuneration for these acts of theft. 
But instead of paying those who had been robbed, abolition paid the thieves. Abolition should have been a process whereby those thieves, namely white men, women, and pro-slavery bureaucrats, aided formerly enslaved African-Americans in their quests to repair the broken bonds and to, to mend the familial ties, which our nation's laws delegitimized in that sale, white inheritance, white debt, and white cruelty had broken. But that's not what abolition was at all. Union soldiers, freedmen's bureau agents, and post-war court officials often refused to help formerly enslaved people reunite with or gain custody of children they'd lost in slavery. In fact, states throughout the South implemented laws that extended and exacerbated Black parents' long and painful separations from their children. But formerly enslaved people didn't let this injustice stand. They immediately set out to find their loved ones. They sometimes stole their former, from their former, stole those children um, from former slave owners um, who refused to let them go. And in what my, we might consider to be reversed runaway ads, they called upon their lost friends to come back to them. Grace Oliver, for example, placed the following ad in the Southwestern Christian Advocate. I wish to find out where my children are, Anthony and Amanda Oliver. I last heard from Anthony in Shreveport. He was then driving a dray. Old Miss Oliver sold him in Millumtown, Eastern Texas, to a man named Joel Holbert. Mrs. Oliver lived near Sabine Town. Mrs. Oliver gave my daughter Amanda to her granddaughter, Mrs. Birdwell, who afterward married Dr. Simon. He lives in Huntsville, Texas. It has been 14 or 15 years since I heard from them. Anyone knowing of them will do me a great favor by letting them know where I am or letting me know where they are. Address Gracie Oliver, care of Frank Falconer, Milliken, Brazos County, Texas, April 5th, 1882. So what lesson can we learn from this very dark reflection on slavery's abolition? Just one look at the black codes. Um, these are laws that governed the mobility and freedoms of African-Americans after slavery, make it clear that slavery wasn't really abolished, but merely refashioned and renamed. Black people understood this and they continued to recognize how the vestiges of the institution continued to constrain and stifle black liberation. The means by which to achieve black liberation have always been in the hands of those who yearned for it the most. The tools that have made it possible for us to draw closer to black liberation have been designed and deployed by those who tire tirelessly sought that freedom. This invention was necessary because since its founding, American democracy was premised on the full or partial exclusion of Black people, even if it never stated this explicitly. And as a consequence, the tools of democracy proved and continue to prove ineffectual in securing to Black folks the things promised by the nation, especially justice. Perhaps then contemporary calls for abolition are onto something. After all, how can a justice system developed in such a way to categorically deny justice to black people ever ensure that they get it? How can a police state with roots in the patrols charged with routine hunting, capture, and even murder of black people evolve into an apparatus that serves its prey? If black people's responses to slavery's abolition offer any clues, they can't. Their responses to abolition should inform our thinking about who should be leading these movements and who should be developing the tools and techniques for abolishing the institutions that continue to exploit and subjugate people of African descent. And I really look forward to our conversation. So that's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Stephanie. That uh, two, two things immediately come to mind and I just can't, I, I can't not say them. One, one is of course, like the, the numbers, the, the numbers that we would have been dealing with in, uh, nine, in, in 1866, right, with four million persons enslaved are just so flabbergasting. We get this small recurring taste of it today, right, with 545 children separated at the border who cannot find their parents, whose parents cannot find them, 545, which is, and 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 to think how many more there would have been right 
in uh, in in 1866, right? I mean, um, it's 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 inconceivable today. 545. It's in, inconceivable to imagine the hundred thousands uh, in 150 years ago, and it's inconceivable that we haven't learned these lessons. Um, uh, and the, the other thing I just have to mention is how how perfectly your intervention actually tied back to Maves on the question of rights, right? Because um, the, in part, and, and in part you're offering, I think, a, a beginning of an answer to the question I was posing to Maeve, which was what is the what are the investments in having a framework of rights around which abolition gets talked about today or over time and that investment in part is to then kind of give life to the framework of rights which is the idea that well we can turn to rights we can turn to the rule of law we can turn to these structures which have historically been the structures that oppress as a way to get beyond them. But of course, the question you asked was, can you possibly believe that you could use those same structures to get beyond them? And it was in part the question that we asked last, last session with the police, right? Can you possibly believe that the criminal justice system would be the system that could get us beyond police violence and police killings when in fact it's so clear that the criminal justice system has operated in this way to create the problem in the first place and maintain it, right? So um, perfect dialogue uh, with the, the issues that Maeve uh, was raising. And um, uh, so thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and we will come back to, uh, to those questions uh, after we hear from uh, Dennis Childs, who, uh, was putting in the chat uh, how much he was agreeing with what you were saying. Word. So, uh, Dennis, go ahead. Thank you. And I want to uh, echo uh, the words of thanks to you, Bernard, and also uh, to Fonda for organizing this and all the students, faculty, community members who are present. Uh, and I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, I just have to say, yeah, word to what Stephanie was just offering. Uh, I especially liked uh, the intervention she makes along the lines of reading slavery from the purview, from the experiential purview of Africans themselves, uh, rather than what Lee Song would call history with a capital H. Uh, and she used the word granular. And I think that that's a perfect entry point into what I have to offer today. And in and, and, and that regard, I just want to say when you know, I'm going to speak specifically about um, prison abolition in relationship to slave abolition, slavery abolition. And in, in doing that, I want to just put a finger on the fact that in talking and using the words prison abolition, abolition, uh, activists, many activists, former prisoners are not speaking metaphorically, that it's actually, uh, you know, a non metaphoric recognition of the connections between uh, what I call in my work prison slavery and chattel slavery. But the place to go, um, just as Stephanie's words took us to, is the words of prisoners themselves, uh, specifically the theoretical interventions of black radical political prisoners, people such as George Jackson, Asada Shakur, Sophia Bukhari, uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Robert King Wilkerson, Albert Wood Fox, um, Angela Davis, who, as we know, is not only an incredible scholar from the University of California, but actually uh, went through what some prisoners, radical prisoners, call the university setting of being in prison and politically in prison herself. And what those um, those writings and 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 the praxis of the, those that I named and and you know thousands of others that I'm not naming talk about is that. The modern modern deployment of the term abolition marks the degree to which imprisonment and the larger police states state that fills up uh, the nation's cages, migrant detention camps and prison plantations does, in fact, represent a continuation of chattel slavery. In other words, 
abolition is not a metaphor. Uh, Bernard was talking about, you know, the the unabidable and unspeakable fact of familial separation at the border and what's happening with children at the border and you know the the hundreds and hundreds of families dealing with that and the permutations that are uncountable there but i think it's important to you know think about what stephanie was talking about in terms of theft and familial separation being a kind of fundament of chattel slavery and the ways in which convict leasing chain gang system prison plantations the penitentiary system represent a regime of family separation and legal kidnapping that literally represents an uncountable toll of family family separation of legal legal abduction and so i wanted to just share some words that some of you may have seen um, in my book if you read any part of it from george jackson and his book soledad brother uh, on this issue of him actually talking in a non-metaphoric way about his his uh, recognition of the continuance of slavery or what he calls neo-slavery. My recall is nearly perfect. Time has faded nothing. I recall the very first kidnap. I lived through the passage, died on the passage, laying in the unmarked shallow graves of the millions who have fertilized the American soil with their corpses, cotton and corn growing out of my chest unto the third, unto the fourth, unto the hundredth generation. My mind ranges back and forth through the uncounted generations, and I feel everything that they felt but double. I can't help it. There are too many things to remind me of the 23 and a half hours a day that I'm in this cell. Not 10 minutes go, goes by without a reminder. In between, I'm left to speculate on what form the reminder will take. Uh, and so, um, that again is from Soledad brother, brother, and it's one of his letters that came from uh, the early 1970s. And here we hear an echoing of what Toni Morrison might call rememory, the way in which the experience of solitary confinement, Jackson before he was assassinated on the yard of San Quentin in August of 1971, had spent seven of his approximate 10 years of, of imprisonment in solitary confinement. Um, and we hear what Re Re Morrison describes as rememory, rememory, the experience of solitary confinement, uh, enacting a kind of bending of time or a warping of time, where the liberal white supremacist notion of a kind of neat, progressive passage from the back then of slavery to the now of freedom is shown to be completely uh, obliterated for the black captive. Um, and this is a, and I want to just stress here something that Joy James and her work also looks at and what she, what she describes as the work of imprisoned intellectuals, the way in which if we want to talk about prison abolition, it's really important to think about that as an epistemological framework that is born from the experience of prison slaves themselves. Uh, and I, I don't think enough can be, that, that that can be stressed enough. And that as we move forward with more kind of um, engagement such as this, it's really important that we involve prisoners themselves and former prisoners. I'm thinking of, of organizations like All of Us or None, for instance, um, that uh, has 27 or so chapters throughout the country, including here in San Diego, where I'm at today, run by uh, the incredible former prisoner and prison abolitionist Dorsey Nunn and here in, in San Diego by Curtis Howard. And the way in which, if we're gonna to continue to have these dialogues, it's important to keep framing them, th framing the dialogue through not only the experience of prisoners as kind of objects of analysis, which in the ivory tower, there's a tendency to treat of, even if you're trying to do a so-called radical project, to think about the subjects that you're studying as objects rather than subjects that produce their own epistemology. So I think that I you know, just want to make that very clear. Um, but from the, st the, the purview of the US uh, colonial, settler colonial slaveocracy, to treat of slavery and, and, and the prison, the so-called system of law and order, as uh, two parts of a kind of a, a, a continual repression of black people would be considered anathema and is. Um, and it's and this is a part of what you you may have seen the the kind of panic around the 1619 project from the New York Times as an example of this. Um, but 
there is, a, a, along with that, a kind of real investment in, in a denial of, or what could be called slavery denial in the United States. Um, and that's not to say that slavery didn't exist, but as we've been talking about so far, what was and is slavery? Um, so it's uh, not the denial of its existence, but the enormity of its impact on our lives today that is at stake. Um, and, and seeing slavery as much more than a kind of political economic structure, a kind of system of economic repression, as Stephanie was calling it, a kind of looking at it at, at its granular levels, we have to think of it as a system of economic, political, cultural, ideological, legal, social violence. Ma Maeve was talking about the culpability of the liberal system of legality uh, in this process of giving basically black people the right to be re-enslaved. The very amendment the constitution that was supposed to, to have freed 4 billion uh, Africans, the 13th amendment's exception clause, which legalized slavery in the form of criminalization. So this is to read slavery as both foundational to and productive of modern social, economic, political, legal, and cultural relations. Um, I just wanted to think about uh, along those lines also uh, the way in which in, not just in kind of right wing diatribes, uh, you know, against the 1619 project, but there's also a tendency within certain wings of what might be called abolitionist scholarship to say, wait a minute, you can't compare slavery with pr imprisonment because, you know, for instance, maybe a prisoner is getting paid 30 cents an hour for the work they're doing or Maybe most of the prisoners aren't working in the penitentiary. They're just being warehoused. So how could you compare it? Or it's not just black people there. All of these kind of um, modes of trying to deny is something that also is hap can, can re reveal itself even within the abolitionist movement itself. There's also the call to be specific. You can't just play fast and loose comparing centuries of time. Um, but I think Jackson's words are important in that regard because he says, what form will the reminder take? So it's not to treat of the past and present as homological or exactly the same, the same, but to see a continuity between the past and the present that's at stake. And there being real, again, uh, stakes involved in doing so. Dennis seems to be, at least on, on, on my end here, uh, seems to have been interrupted in terms of uh, his presentation. Um, let, me, uh, let me give him a moment possibly to, to re, reboot or come back. Um, why don't I, let's see, okay. Uh, let's see, Some uh, Fonda, perhaps you could, um, get in touch with Dennis um, and uh, ask him to kind of uh, come back to the Zoom. I wanna, I wanna say that uh, I, I agree entirely uh, with Dennis's point that this is a not, not a metaphor, right? That this is not a metaphor. In, fa in fact, I mean, the, the whole, the, this whole intervention, this whole seminar series is, is non-metaphorical in the sense of trying to find, trying to find the exact connections and actually doing that work. And, and part of it is the historical work. Part of it is, part of it is just returning to the texts, uh, but doing that work to show that the transformation from the de jure enslavement and the question and the, and, and slavery as chattel property in the law to a system of de facto uh, racial uh, hierarchy and a caste system is indeed is not metaphorical, and we and we see it precisely by the use of the criminal law following uh, emancipation. And we see it, and we hear it, and we heard it as and from the beginning, right? We've been returning to this text, Black Reconstruction in America, where Du Bois identified it himself and he identified that link. For instance, on page 506, where he writes, the whole criminal system came to be used as a method of keeping Negroes at work 
and intimidating them. And consequently, there began to be a demand for jails and penitentiaries uh, beyond what would have been associated with any form of criminality, right? And so starting there and trying to trace exactly how it is, not metaphorically, but actually how it is um, that, uh, that there was a transformation that created uh, uh, convict leasing uh, as a way to uh, reenact slavery, to, to recreate a form of slavery through convict leasing or through the plantation uh, prisons. And of course, the, uh, the work that uh, Dennis has done himself. Ah, you're back. Great. Uh, are you there? Uh, the work that Dennis has done himself to, in arc, to archive and to, to find in the archive these connections. Uh, and so, as you saw at the, uh, Dennis, please do join us. Are you there? Yeah. Okay. Great. So sorry, we just had a blackout in my. Oh no! <laughs> as it as it were. <laughs> are you so, out in uh, the times we you, live in? Are you? Uh, you're on the West Coast, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah? Uh, luckily, the power has just been restored. So apologies. Okay. For that. Uh, All right. But good, I, good, if it's okay, I'll I was, just take two, two minutes to finish up. Yeah, that would right. be great. And then and then I'll tell you what I was saying and, and, and how much I was trying to support and, uh, and, and corroborate what you were suggesting. Go ahead. But okay. If, so um, I just wanted to uh, talk about what I was saying before about the process of slavery denial and how this can even happen within certain modes of academic discourse that describe themselves as abolitionist and a, and a part of that is kind of the tendency to want to be historically specific and you know if you read the works of prisoners themselves it's not about treating of the past and present as, as exactly the same but also there's this tendency to not really see slavery in terms of that idea of slavery denial for its full reach um, what what the works of those former slaves uh, black prison narratives written by those such as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs along with more modern black abolitionist writings of those such as Shakur and Jackson, Asada Shakur teach us is that slavery and neo-slavery encompass a broad spectrum of repression, including but not limited to legalized kidnapping, legally unredressable rape and sexualized violence. Um, and we're seeing that in terms of what's happening and getting a lot of attention now with migrant women. But again, this is a pattern that has been going on in, in US prisons for decades uh, with, with respect to black and, and brown women and poor women. And also the work of racist ideology, the ide ideology of white supremacy, spatial subjection. Uh, if you think about the prison as a carceral institution, the, the relationship between the architectures of slave holds, barracoons, uh, slave pens, sweat boxes, strip cells, prison plantations, et cetera. So in, a, so in other words, slavery was and is not only a mode of economic production, uh, but a system of legal and cultural and social reproduction, or what S Sylvia Winter describes as ontological subordination. The very sense of white uh, civil belonging and being in the world being defined by both slavery and what Saidia Hartman calls its afterlives. So here we, we get onto that idea of what the uh, one of the main aspects of it being barring Africans and people of African descent from the category of the human. And I just wanted to close out with the words of uh, the sister of Jacob Blake, who was murdered uh, by the police. Uh, her, her name is Latitra, Latitra Widom, uh, who said, uh, uh, you know, when you say the name Jacob Blake, make sure you say father, make sure you say cousin, make sure you say son, but most importantly, make sure you say human. Let it marinate in your mind, a human life, where human and his life matters. And just, you know, you hear echoes of that term Black Lives Matter that mattered there. And that the term Black Lives Matter along with Letitia's words there show that, it, that Black Lives Matter, that notion that we're human implies its opposite, that the state actually treats of Black subjects as non-human being and thereby uh, vulnerable to the types of predation that we see in both prisons and going back through time. Um, so uh, in, to, to close, the past is not past. For black and indigenous and the other oppressed peoples, 
It is a living specter that haunts us every day. And as we unfold a politics and theory of uh, abolition, we don't recognize this connectivity of the past and present at our peril and to the peril of our vision of an abolitionist future. As Asada Shakur warns, to be truly free, you have to re first recognize that you are a slave. And in the words of Fannie Lou Hamer, uh, a long time ago, but very relevant today, none of us are free until all, all of us are free. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you so much. So while you were in, in, in the blackout, um, what I was <laughs> trying to emphasize was the point you were making, which you know, I agree with entirely and in, in some sense kind of motivates this project of Abolition Democracy 1313, which is that this is not metaphorical not metaphorical. And I was, I was reading, of course, from, you know, from Du Bois's passages where he speaks specifically about the whole criminal system being used as a method to replace um, the, the property system, uh, that the, the criminal law was used as a way to replace the, the, in order to create de facto the kind of slavery uh, that de jure had existed before. And, you know, um, I'm going to share quickly on the screen. Of course, uh, many of you have read this. It's, it's a piece. It's, it's your second chapter. Uh, I think I've got it right here. It's your second chapter. Have I been able to share it? I don't know if you're able to see it out there. Um, but it's the sec second, your, your second chapter from your book where you have these, you have these, these public sale announcements, right? Um, uh, where it says, and 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 uh, can can you out there see the the page uh, from uh, your book, Dennis? Uh, is I can everyone see, it. Able to see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. We have public sale. The undersigned will sell at the courthouse door. This is from your book. I mean, this is a this is a page of your book. Uh, in the city of Annapolis at twelve o'clock on Saturday, eighth December, a Negro man named Richard Harris for six months convicted at the October term, eighteen sixty six at the Arundel uh, County Circuit Court for larceny, sentenced by the court to be sold as a slave, right? Terms of sale, December 1866, right? Um, uh, public sale, underside officer, again, uh, uh, convicted uh, for uh, larceny, uh, sentenced to be sold. Another Negro man convicted, sold for a term of one year uh, in the state. Negro woman sold for a term of one year in the state for conviction, convicted again and again. It was the use of the criminal law and the creation of convict leasing to plantation prisons that was in direct continuity. These aren't metaphors, and we're still uh, living in them today. Um, so thank you, Dennis, for that. Thank you. Uh, now, let me ask everybody to turn on their videos because uh, here's what I'd like to do. I mean, I'd like to start the conversation. There are three, three topics I'd like to uh, address uh, as a group, uh, all of you. So um, if, you, if you could uh, uh, join us again, Maeve and Stephanie and um, also Dredd, if you're uh, there. Um, so the first has to do with uh, this this rights, this idea that 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 uh, Maeve uh, brought on, and then um, Stephanie spoke of as well, which is really about uh, uh, the rights framework, uh, and the rights framework is becoming the dominant way in which we uh, come to speak about abolition. Now, the the reason I I mean, so I want to interrogate that. I want to, and let me throw out a proposition. Let me throw out an, a, a suggestion, a hypothesis, an idea. Somehow the rights framework gets privileged over the warfare framework, civil warfare, violent resistance, um, because it becomes part of this progressive narrative of believing in a liberal rights regime which increases the protections Right? And so we have this imagination, this myth, we have this idea, this illusion that, you know, well, of course, the founding was a too limited, it was property white males, but that expanded to uh, uh, women, it expanded to uh, African Americans, and, and now we achieve kind of universal rights in some way. And I think that, that there's a real investment in that, um, rather than telling a story of continuing combat. And why? In part, because what it does is it legitimates ultimately uh, a framework uh, as opposed to one which is much more of a political combat, of an ongoing political combat. Um, so what are your thoughts about that? 
Um, and um, uh, how, how did, and, and did, did you, in, in part, Dred, I, I think that um, one of the reasons that the history has buried the slave revolts, right? And that there isn't enough about it that we know so that you have to recreate it and you have to reimagine it is precisely because it was a moment of that much more violent confrontational, right? War paradigm rather than the paradigm of, you know, civil rights in a sense. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the thing is the enslaved, this, in 1811, and I think many other slave rules, they weren't trying to say, let's make America work, or let's make France, French colonial society live up to the rights of man. They were like, to hell with this. The problem is that we're enslaved. We need to overthrow the system of enslavement. And I think that, you know, the the question in a certain sense for, you know, modern day abolitionists is to get on that tip to actually say, look, America, I mean, it's, it's not even just that prisons, you, I mean, you cannot do away with the prison state that America has and actually still have America the way it is, much the way you could not eliminate enslavement in 1820 you know, and still have America what it is. And for me, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to make America work. I'm done with that experiment. It is a nightmare and a horror. It has been since day one. And the enslaved in 1811 in this revolt were done with it. They weren't trying to make a petition to, to Jefferson and say, hey, let's see, can we actually make sure that this three-fifths of man thing gets struck out? And, and can we possibly like be treated as human? They, they started from, we are human and we are going to do what's necessary to secure a place and a society where we can live and be freely associating human beings. And I think for you know the, the, the legacy of abolitionists, I think, you know, grappling with that and trying to say, well, what, what can, you know, part of why I wanted to reenact this, this particular revolt was that it, it, this vision of say, setting up an African Republic in the new world and is something that people, modern day people can learn from. And while we could have lots of conversations about how people get free today, the orientation of the problem is we were enslaved, the solution is to end the system of enslavement is something that modern day people can actually learn from a lot and apply in very creative ways. And it would remove the shackles of people trying to figure out, well, look, can we maybe figure out how we can, you know, sort of get to a system which sort of imprisons less people as opposed to imprisons nobody. Right, right. Right. It's in some sense, it's that the 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 different project, which is not the like uh, expanding rights project, fixing the rights project, the alternative project is much more threatening, right? And that's that's why, in part, it is. I think that's why, in part, it is um, buried. Uh, because it is so much more threatening, because it's not part of just tweaking and reforming, it's fundamentally creating something different. And in, in the case of what you were reenacting, fundamentally creating a separate, a separate state, a separate uh, space, a political space. Stephanie, you're, you're nodding. So, um, so uh, I want to hear from you. And then I'm going to Maeve to just on this point, because uh, Maeve, you kind of uh, started the the thread. Go ahead, Stephanie. No, I I I a hundred percent agree with Dread. I think um, what we what we very rarely um, recognize is just how many people are deeply invested in the perpetration of these systems. Whether we talk about slavery or we talk about the prison system that so many people benefit from their perpetuation um, by sustaining those systems and so people some people that should be on board with abolition aren't on board with abolition because in spite of all, all things, all likes, uh, all looks, they, they are deeply invested in, in the continuation of, of those institutions that oppress other people. So I think, you know, enslaved people recognize that, you know, and I think prisoners recognize that, Prison these groups mm -hmm. recognize how deeply invested um, a whole, a a whole slew of folks are, even if they never owned an enslaved person, there are all these people that are deeply invested in the perpetuation of the institution and thus fight to keep it in place. And so I think, you know, black people understood, enslaved people understood you had to completely destroy the system and they weren't interested in preserving the, the country if if that had to go to. So, I mean, that's why I was, you know, shaking my head a lot. Great, great. Okay, great, good, good, good. Um, Maeve, 
back to you since you started this thread. Uh, uh, so I, I would I would just um, echo Stephanie in thinking about the depth of which there was an investment in the system beyond you know individual enslavers, the way in which you have this entire um, system that, as uh, Dennis was sketching out, the uh, or range from racist ideology, spatial subjugation, the architecture of slavery, all, all embedded. And what strikes me is that when that's the, the vantage point and when we think about it through this granular vocabulary that Stephanie has given us uh, and to distill slavery as a system of theft that would demand reparations that never emerged, I think it helps to reframe that, that or better understand um, why it is that this rights talk became so uh, powerful. And in fact, I'm, I'm reminded of, um, of the spring of 1857 in Boston. Uh, the, the Supreme Court had just now announced its decision in Dred Scott and a, one of the, the uh, city's black abolitionists had the idea of convening a protest modeled around the American Revolution. And the logic of that protest was based on the uh, the celebration of Christmas Atticus and the idea that there was a right of citizenship that had been born through picking up a, a arm, a, you know, arms to fight for the nation state, and within that formulation, right, which is actually starting from the premise that there are rights of citizenship that can be proven contrary Justice Taney, right, that, that are rooted in the very history, within that moment, there was another strand of uh, participants who were arguing against that framing and presenting a different discourse. And they don't know that they're maybe they're not necessarily exclusive. Um, in this particular event in the spring of 1857, we see both discourses. It's framed around hearkening back to a violent resistance, but that gave birth to the nation state. Um, but embedded in that moment, you have abolitionists who are presenting the counter image, not of rights derived from the nation state that can be then you know, expanded or contracted with constitutional amendments, but something much more fundamental. And so I'm thinking here um, of the, there was a series of poems that were read that began with the idea of a struggle of a war that was existing far beyond the narrow confines of the, the, of the state. And it was that, uh, uh, attempt to try to foreground the more basic fundamental struggle that could not necessarily be resolved through, you know, a, a constitutional amendment that, you know, as Dennis, as we've just seen, um, could be reifying the very systems of oppression uh, themselves. Right. Yeah. So, and so let me just plant two flags for purposes of, 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 of the seminar and, and, and future seminars and, and the next seminar actually. So the notion of theft, Stephanie, that you really put on the table here is particularly, um, uh, is, is, is particularly relevant uh, to, to actually to our next seminar, uh, which uh, has as its center uh, Proudhon's statement Right, that property is theft, um, and and uh, and so we'll be we'll be analyzing that question. Now, what was always so puzzling about that statement, of course, this was in Proudhon and Marx fought over this. I mean, it was the issue was it, does the idea of theft itself depend on a notion of property rights? Um, and so, in other words, is the notion of theft itself derivative in some way of a, of a rights system uh, such that, uh, and, and in, a, in part this was Marx's critique, so of, of Proudhon um, in Proudhon's, which is a response to Proudhon's book, you know, what is property um, to which he answered, it's theft. Uh, but so, so this is an interesting question and it, it's gonna tie nicely into our next session in December where we'll be uh, focusing on the question of uh, the abolition of property and, um, and, and the question of theft, uh, property as theft. Uh, but it does raise this puzzle uh, about the rights framework. And then the second, the other flag I wanna plant has to do with the uh, prison abolition and, and death penalty abolition as well, which we'll be getting to uh, in February. 
uh, in March, and of course I'm a, I'm a death penalty lawyer, I, I, I only have rights in generally when I represent my clients on death row. I only, I only have rights. I only have due process. That's the only thing I have. I don't have another narrative. I don't have that other narrative uh, in those cases uh, when I'm trying to stop the execution, when I'm trying to end the death sentence, you know? Um, so, in a, so how is it that when we engage in forms of abolition, uh, uh, how, how is it that we can get kind of cornered into that space, which itself is a space that re-legitimizes itself uh, and the death penalty and the criminal justice system and the prison, et cetera. Um, uh, but, but, but the truth is I don't have anything else but due process rights uh, uh, in these cases. Um, so plant a flag for the, for the conversations we'll be having in February about the abolition of the death penalty and the abolition of the prison. Thanks. All right, second topic is, okay, so continuity. So we see the continuities uh, brilliantly. We see the continuities, I mean, in everything and from, from Dredd's reenactment, uh, the whole question of the continuities in terms of who is it that is actually uh, advancing uh, the, uh, the 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 ambition of abolition, uh, the continuities in in Dennis's uh, work uh, directly from the from the slave property uh, system to the criminal uh, system that re reenacts and 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 recreates uh, uh, the system of slavery. So, and that is a fundamental point of this this seminar and this discussion but what do we is there something we're missing by emphasizing the continuities what is it about the differences that we also need to pay attention to um and how how would they help us in our struggle as well uh so dennis why don't you kick us off yeah First of all, I just wanted to respond to one of the two uh, provocations you set out for yeah. the next discussions, which is to say, yeah. one of the ways out of your bind there is to not be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was just thinking about the great Derek Bell, the late great Derek Bell, with your comments, and the the one of the and you know I mean that partially facetiously, in the sense that critical race theory had to leave the confines of legal liberal legal discourse in order to foment a kind of abolitionist agenda within their writings, you know, you know, you know so uh, it, it, people like Cheryl Harris and Derek Bell, Kimberly Crenshaw and, and Derek Bell's piece, uh, the great one, the space traders. And this is a kind of segue into the into your question here about the differences. You know, I, I'm working on a, a piece on that, that story right now, space traders. And it's a it's a seems to be a kind of post apocalyptic or speculative piece about aliens coming from outer space and offering to solve all of the social problems of the US and economic and ecological problems of the United States by you know for if they if the US would just be willing to trade one thing for those all those wonderful outcomes and that one thing was its black population um, I'm sure many of you have read that that piece and if you haven't you need to um, but the interesting thing about but that, but Dennis, but Dennis, one one quick thing, and sorry, I'm going to interrupt. And I don't want to take sure. this too dark or anything. But you know, sure. some of my friends would be dead if I hadn't used rights to represent them. So you know, I mean, I, we got to think. We got to think about strategies, and we got to think about working together. We got to think about alternative forms and whatnot. But you know. I got a couple of people in mind who are close to me who wouldn't be alive if it were there's no there was no other system at the time there was no other approach at the time but the habeas corpus you know? no no so I, I i don't want you to get me wrong that of course the the law the you know to audrey lord's notion of the master's tools we have to deal with the hand we're dealt but you know my father was killed by police officers in the united states 
uh, your clients, if it wasn't for the U.S. being the regime that it is, wouldn't have been on death row often in the first place for you to have to represent them. So that's kind of what we're getting at, that the structure itself reproduces the need for someone to be a defense mm -hmm. attorney for someone on death row. Mm -hmm. So, you know, let's not forget that the structure is what we're talking about here. And then you're doing that really important, like, grunt work of representing somebody in that hellhole is not something that I am saying that is not important. But the question is, how do we keep there from being death rows in the first place? You know, and I think Derek Bell offered a lot of, and I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the story that I'm talking about, the space traders. You know, he said he had to go to creative fiction because of the foreclosures within the, the, the realm of legal discourse. As you said, all I have is the, the narrative, the forms of narration of the law in order to represent my clients. So I was actually responding to something that you said about those kind of foreclosing. And it's not to say that someone can't be saved, you know, from, from, from you know, facing the death penalty. But at the same time, you know, my father was murdered by police when I was seven years old and there was nobody holding cameras there was no movement to represent him and that and it was actually celebrated on television that's the way i found out about it as a 7 year old was you know he was shot in the back five times and so for you know even if we grant that there are exceptions and that sometimes people are saved from it uh from the grinding nature of this what what Derek Bell's story tells us is that the because the the voice of the alien in that story is in the form of Ronald Reagan uh, no. and, and and the and and the reason why he puts that voice of Ronald Reagan as the alien offering to abduct all black people in exchange for solving all social problems is because it's an allegory of the prison industrial complex. It's exactly what happened with Reagan. The idea that social problems can be solved through having a reinstitution of the death penalty, a prison industrial complex that incarcerates 2.3 million people. Because for me, the answer to the death pe to to death penalty is not let's save someone from being killed by the state so that they can be legally entombed for the rest of their life. That's not the goal here. So, you know, even, at, and it's interesting with Mumia Abu-Jamal, whose poster is behind me, a lot of people got off the bandwagon of working for Mumia's case when he got off death row, as if the job was done. So I think, I think we need to be really careful with like a kind of binary notion of, you know, either we work through the law or we work you know, in a revolutionary sense, of course we can't do that. But at the same time, uh, you know, they're, 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 you know, the very existence of death row as an institution of, of the prison system itself is what's at issue in, in the work of people like Derek Bell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Let me just interrupt, I mean, to say how, um, how, uh, how, how sorry I think we, everyone on this panel is to hear about uh, your father. Okay. And, I, and I, so thank you for that. And I just wanted to, you know, quickly okay. say that in terms of the differences that I, I got at it with Derek Bell in the sense that what we charge genocide is a document that came out in 1951 from the Civil Rights Congress. I would just suggest everybody read it if they haven't. And one of the things that um, Ozzie Davis says in the 1970 forward to the reissue of that, it was originally a, a petition that was given to the United Nations is that because black labor is becoming obsolete in a kind of automating and post-industrial society, that what would the United States come up with as a solution for the problem of, of the existence of black people in a country that no longer needs us for that kind of labor? And so the, 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 the move that William Patterson and Claudia Jones, all the way up to the new African prisoners organization in 1970s who issues a document called we still charge genocide is that one of the main differences is that issue of a kind of turning of the majority of the black population into a kind of disposable population. So I just offer that as another addition to our discussion. Mm, thanks, thanks. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, please know how, um, how much uh, we are with you. Um, um, so, but that was, but that was on, so, um, so we were on the topic of continuities and, and differences, um, and, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe any, 
any any other thoughts? I mean, this so so the the our conversation about kind of rights frameworks versus more political combative frameworks. How do you end the society that makes it possible to have the death penalty, right? As you know, uh, Moton and Harney say, right? Um, which is a whole different question than just recalibrating rights. Um, how, does that, is that, um, does that tie then to the question of continuities and differences or um, or are we on are we on a different are we are we in a different conversation uh, or what is it are there some are there important differences between the kind of experiences that we have today whether it's kind of marching through those petroleum refineries today and the environmental poverty issues, et cetera, today that, that we need to be thinking about in this rethinking of our abolitionist struggles today. Do you see what I mean? Does that make sense? Um, because I think we are still much more on the continuities than we are on the differences. And so the question then becomes, which ones could we pick up on uh, to refine, to help us to, to I don't know, uh, to think through uh, our abolitionist struggles today, um, Maeve, you were you were there was something about the way you were moving your head that made me think you were you had something to 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 say on this point. I think um, I think so. One of the things that really has resonated with me as I've been listening to this idea, Dennis, that you had raised of the slavery denial and. Uh, the ways in which that in and of itself can be seen as a continuity. I mean, I think that there's, I remember I had a student in class once who observed that that word slavery uh, has lost its meaning, that we can talk about slavery and it doesn't, if, if it, it doesn't necessarily do the work in that single work, because as a student pointed out, we've used it so cavalierly and so gone are, it makes it possible thinking about uh, what it means to deny not slavery itself, but the the ongoing impact that it's had. And I can't, that is for me, one, one line of continuity is this uh, unwillingness uh, on the part of uh, white Americans uh, to uh, historically to grapple with and recognize what is slavery at that granular level that, that Stephanie was suggesting. And so I think in one way, if we're trying to find out continuities, um, that, that question, and then I think that that's actually one area uh, that over the past you know 30 years, I remember so reading Adrian Davis um, and talking about how we don't have the vocabulary for slavery. And you know that was in the 1980s. But I think that's one area where we've actually seen a real shift uh, of just, uh, we now have the ways to describe it based on the work of historians and scholars and activists. So that's there. Um, and so I think if we're trying to think about not just continuities in the past, but where we go, it seems to me that that is one, um, one long arc of continuity that has within it this new generative, not new, I mean, the past 20 years, historians think that happens, things that happen the past 30 years are new, but this, the relatively recently, you know, th 20 decades, uh, two decades of, um, of just raising the, uh, the, the visibility of what this, what this institution was. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think Go ahead, the, the, the question of sort of continuity and different, I mean, I, and I'm just thinking about this now, but the, that enslavement in the United States to the degree it was ended was largely ended through the process of the Civil War. Um, and that was not something which the abolitionists were like, hey, let's plan a civil war, let's invade the South. And we're, I mean, that, you know, there were, you know, the questions about whether uh, uh, John Brown and Harriet Tubman talked about something like that. But I mean, the, but that's actually not how most of the abolitionist thinking was. And to the degree that, that, you know, I mean, 13th Amendment set aside, 
you know, um, with the, the, you know, allowing for slavery after incarceration um, or conviction, um, you know, it, it, it actually did take this sort of outside event in a certain sense to actually transform that institution and, and sort of also fundamentally change the economy. Um, and, and so I think that there is something for us to kind of think about those of us who are prison abolitionists to say, well, okay, wh what would it, you know, is there a way in which there is that continuity that would actually take a civil war to end prison, in prisons in the United States or to actually transform the society such that there, there isn't the foundation which necessitates prisons the way they are? Um, and and what, what are the implications of that answers to that question for the work that we do. Because I think a lot of us are, I mean, even something as simple as like when the, the, when the notion in, in the response to George Floyd, the notion of abolish the police got broad societal discourse. And some people were saying, we mean it metaphorically and other people were like, no, no, we mean this literally, we want to abolish the police. And then, you know, like in Minneapolis, they were like, hey, cool, we're gonna abolish the police. And then within, you know, probably seconds in reality, but weeks in terms of public discourse, it was like, nah, no, nah, we didn't really mean abolish the police. We're, we're, gonna, and we're gonna have another commission to investigate a commission and maybe we'll think about restructuring some funding which might in some ways limit some of the roles of maybe one or two chokeholds on some occasional instances if it's caught on video. And so, you know, there is this way in which I think we, there's a, a sharp battle because the, 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 the way that the subjugation of black people is foundational to the United States is not something you can actually just say, okay, we're going to wave a magic wand and change that. I think it can be changed, but I don't think it can be changed as long as you have the United States. And I'm again, perfectly happy to get rid of this country, but I think that people need to actually confront that. And then also think, you know, what would it take? Are, are there outside actions that are sort of unpredicted by our subjective political discourse that will, will sort of create the possibility for doing away with some of the oppression that we see today. So. Right, 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 right. No, that, and that's right. I mean, in other words, in, other words uh, in terms of continuities and differences, you know, we, we have a stark difference today where, where in fact, maybe we need continuity. The stark difference being that we don't have a fund, we don't have a, I don't know if it's, we don't have the immense social transformation associated with a civil war. We're, we're in a period of where there is reform, which is why in part the reform pieces of it become so recurrent and come to the surface. Why, why abolition becomes defund Right. And, 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 and defund becomes acceptable because, in fact, it's not really abolishing. It's simply kind of moving some of the monies elsewhere, moving it from uh, um, moving it from, say, the NYPD to the Board of Education so that the police officers are actually paid from a different pot. Right. But the question you're asking, Dredd, is do we do we need more continuity in terms of the radicality of the transformation? Uh, which uh, which we might not be experiencing right now in order to achieve the same kind of transformation uh, of uh, or elimination of the of the penitentiary. Um, uh, what I, you know, there was one other one other topic I wanted to to pick on, but I, but we've got a lot of questions, and uh, so I want to leave time for our students to ask questions. The other topic that I did want to talk raise questions about was on Derek Bell, uh, again, uh, the questions of uh, another piece of his work, the, the, the issues of uh, interest convergence, right, as, as being the only way in which uh, there will be times in which, uh, you know, white uh, uh, persons will, will think of themselves as having uh, an interest in assisting in some way, participating in some way. Uh, and of course, Derek, Bell was very, um, uh, not very sanguine about uh, the possibility of w working together, except when there were these interest convergences. And that was something I also wanted to touch on. But uh, we have some 
uh, we have a lot of questions uh, coming in. And so why don't we start taking some of them and some of these interventions. And I'm going to ask um, uh, Sanya Anwar, uh, why don't you turn on your video, come on in and, uh, and, uh, and ask the question that you, you were having. And Sanya wrote a terrific uh, blog in the, res in the resources for today's uh, discussion called uh, Paradise Lost. Uh, so go ahead. So I wanted to talk about um, uh, where you just left off, which was this radicality of transformation. And I want to call it instead of radicality, a reckoning. Um, and that is what my question is about. Um, oftentimes there is some form of constitutional reckoning at a societal scale that follows um, a movement for equality or justice. We saw that here in this nation uh, with reconstruction. It was aborted. And then elsewhere, we've seen that in South Africa, for example, with the Truth Commission um, and the constitutional jurisprudence that followed. Recently, we see that with Chile and its um, constitutional referendum. Um, United States Supreme Court has often come to the rescue of institutions um, which advance the interests of white supremacy. Um, and not so much personhood of Black people. For example, starting with a designation of corporations as persons. And um, recently we had last year Flowers in Mississippi where the Supreme Court, um, again, came to the rescue of preservation of legitimacy of the system rather than preservation of the dignity or um, of personhood of the Black defendant. And in light of where we are at right now with the political situation we have, where um, we have 72 million people who just voted for a symbol of white supremacy, a symbol who refuses and denies, you know, going with slavery denial, continuity of that, denies the voice of people who voted him out with his non-concession. Um, do you think there is room for the Supreme Court to finally confront white supremacy, if not for as a threat to the black community, but as a threat to the institution of democracy? And in that, do you see a platform of some sort, um, reclaiming of that platform that was denied, that the, the the reconstruction amendments offered in their in their promise of egalitarianism. Mm -hmm. So, uh, who wants to who wants to start us off here? Um, I, 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 I I have a hard time being optimistic about that, particularly in this particular moment with this particular court. Um, but nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, I think it's important to kind of a, a, address that. Um, who wants to, Dennis, Maeve, Stephanie, Dredd, who wants to kick us off? I can just say very quickly that I think the Supreme Court has long shown that it will indeed, as you say, protect and defend um, institutions and structures and systems of that undergird white supremacy. And I don't see that changing. And that's been the case even with, you know, justices of color um, on, on, the, on the bench. So, I mean, of course, all of them didn't agree to, to this, but um, I just think it's that the history of, of the court um, just doesn't, it doesn't leave me optimistic. So I'm with Bernard on this. Um, so mm -hmm. I'll just say that mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maeve is our resident uh, constitutionalist. You gotta turn your mic on, sorry. So Sonia, I think it's such an interesting question to think about what would it take to get the Supreme Court to confront or acknowledge white supremacy if, and, and would the rule of law, right, be enough to, to trigger that as a concern. And I think I, I share um, uh, Bernard and Stephanie's uh, reasons to be skeptical. I think two interesting like ways that the question tees up is that it seems to suggest, and it goes back to um, what does it take to generate constitutional 
change. Um, and I think that the ways in which uh, we can think of the Supreme Court as the symbol of defining what counts and who counts. Um, and if that's the marker, then, then right, we have a long history of endorsing and committing exclusion. I would say one thing that, you know, in recent days we've seen the Supreme Court willing to speak the talk of racial equality, right? There is, there is a discourse of, okay, we're all on board, we're committed to the cause of racial equality as a way to, uh, to subordinate or exclude other groups. So I think that there's, there's a concern in which how this newfound uh, you know, visibility of speaking about anti-racism and how that can itself be co-opted to uh, advance goals that may not actually be addressing the root problems uh, that so many others have discussed. So I think it's interesting if just thinking, what would it even look like for the Supreme Court to confront white supremacy in the way that you're suggesting, because there's certainly a discourse of a commitment to racial equality, but to what extent is that discourse itself setting up and reifying the other systems of oppression? Yeah, you know, I would say I would say one thing, and then we've got a question from Arabella. Um, I recall about two years ago, I was trying to study the use of the term white supremacy, actually that those terms white supremacy in United States Supreme Court decisions. And, um, and uh, so I need to go back to that research because I've, I've, I, I, don't, I don't remember precisely, but what I do remember um, about what I had found was that the term was actually used more frequently uh, in the 1950s and 60s and has kind of like not been used of recent in recent decades, which uh, I thought was somehow telling something about the court. And um, so anyway, it'd be worth it would be worth doing that. Of course, um, Sonia, as you noted in your post, of course, uh, Eric Foner, our colleague here, does a lot of work kind of kind of revealing the dark uh, underbelly uh, of the United States Supreme Court um, throughout this period. Uh, so, um, so anyone who wants to think about this more, actually, I would encourage you to look at uh, Sonia's, uh, Sonia's essay on the blog. Um, uh, Arabella, uh, Arabella Colombier, do you wanna turn on your video and join us? You've got a question. Hi, good to see you. Uh, go ahead. I'm not hearing you right now, although your microphone seems to be on, but maybe the volume or something. Try and talk. Hi, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, great. Oh, okay, Thanks. great. Uh, I was just saying thank you to everyone. This has been an amazing talk to listen to. Um, I was thinking about how uh, I'm in Professor Harcourt's abolition practicum and I'm doing research for an organization on qualified immunity issues. Uh, but one of the people that I'm working with mentioned that she's starting to work on um, legislation with someone, uh, with a legislator on um, abolishing that uh, exception within the 13th Amendment. And I was really excited hearing about that because it seems long overdue and you know very important uh, but i mentioned it to someone um who kind of just implied that it seemed very like politically infeasible um like it would be such a um difficult thing to actually have um happen to you know make this amendment to the or you know change the 13th amendment um and i was wondering what all of you thought about like about like that feasibility, about whether it's like the right time to try to do that sort of thing, um, if it's like either too much of or like too big of an ask, or if it's too little in terms of the impact, um, whether that would really change things or not. Okay, great, great question. And in fact, uh, our colleague here, Professor Kendall Thomas, has a whole Thirteenth Amendment project, and in, in, in the is, is working on that. And uh, so there's a lot going on in that, but uh, what are the, what, 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 how, how do you, how would that play out? Uh, would it be beneficial? Uh, is it, uh, is it 
aiming at the wrong thing? We're go is, it, is, it, is it pushing us in the direction of the right paradigm that we were critiquing? Dennis, what do you think? Well, thank you, thank you for that question. And, you know, uh, I'll go the other way from what I said earlier. That's when we need people like you doing really important radical law work. <laughs> um, you know, and I have a lot of students who are working on that right now, former students who, you know, are coming out of law programs and, and doing great work along those lines, along an abolitionist framework. So I think it's important. And just to say that, you know, if you haven't looked already at the the recent prison strikes, um, you know, there's a lot of real st good, important work, especially coming out of places like Alabama, a lot of states in the former Confederacy, but going all nationwide. I believe there were about 17 or 18 states where prisoners took part in the most recent strike, demanding a an overturning of the exception clause in the 13th Amendment. So I would just say, you know, it's really important that those working in that vein uh, follow the work of those that are on the front lines, so to speak. And I think that you know, I mentioned we charged genocide earlier. It was interesting, you know, in his part in, in putting that out with the Civil Rights Congress, William Patterson, who was a lawyer, former head of the International Labor Defense, uh, which was a wing of the, the CPUSA, you know, he said we had no, in, there was no conception that when we, when we gave this document to the United Nations, that we were going to succeed in getting the United States charged with genocide. And you know, um, you you may know that the United States didn't even sign the Convention Against Genocide until the Reagan era. So there was there was really, and the, one of the main reasons the United States didn't sign it was because of the idea that of the PR problem that it could be brought, you know, up on charges of genocide against Black and Indigenous people. But um, that's to say that he and others, like I mentioned, Claudia Jones and others. They, 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 they thought of the document as a provocation for movement building um, and that it, it was not the, the end. It was the kind of um, tactical maneuver within a broader coalition of struggle, both in the U.S. and internationally. Uh, and so I would just say that I, I think that the, move, the movement, the abolitionist movement has to work on all fronts. And, 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 it, and, and when you have prisoners who are saying we're tired of being um, robbed of our labor, kidnapped from our loved ones and used in this way or warehoused and saying that they feel like uh, bringing to uh, a head in terms of public discourse, the problematic of the exception clause, I think that there's something of value and merit there. Although it's of course not the be all end all. So I, I but I think it's really important work. I, I think, go ahead, Dred. Yeah, I think this question, I mean, it, it comes back to, I mean, we all need to recognize that the Supreme Court and all courts serve a political purpose. They're not just like there's some abstract law out here that is universally applied throughout all time. I mean, the Supreme Court did both do Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown versus Board. It was part that the times had changed and in part that there was, you know, activists that were trying to actually bring certain cases with, with Brown versus Board. Um, and I think that, you know, there are other cases that sometimes manage to, to break through and, and shift, you know, law and policy, but then, but it's a political battle. And I, I think, you know, I, I really, I mean, I, I think when Dennis was saying, look, we need radical lawyers doing this work, I think, you know, right on to that, whether or not it is going to be successful at this particular juncture, I don't know, I don't have a crystal ball and I'm not as deeply enmeshed in the struggles as, as some of you guys are. But I think that that doing that work is really important, and and it actually, I mean, it, in a certain sense, it 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 gets back to this question that Bernard was saying. Well, all I have is the law when I'm representing death row uh, people, and I think that's true to a point. You do actually have to fight in that arena with the, you know the law, and 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 and. But I also think that there. You know, there are times when certain death row defense, I mean, when it was not just the legal argument, it was the political struggle in society. And, and mm -hmm. even in a minor way, the, the, the movie I just recently saw, Trial of the Chicago Seven, which you can argue about whether it's a quality film or how the Panthers were represented. But I think this question about where Abby Hoffman is talking to uh, Bill Kunstler and saying, look, it's, this is a political trial. This is about what's going on in society. And that's how they were you know, potentially going to win. Now they lost, but then it got overturned on a, appeal. But, but it, you know, th it was that recognition that that whatever is the law is actually a reflection of of 
the political struggle in society and sets those terms and the society reacts back on that. So I think that doing, particularly at this moment, doing work to target qualified immunity is really important and it can be part of an overall battle where people are, are demanding justice and demanding a confrontation of white supremacy, which you know, is more settled, I think, in the streets than in the courts, but the courts do then codify some of what's in the streets. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, thanks for thanks for saying that, Dred. I mean, I, because I, I was being a little bit uh, uh, excessive. Yeah, you're right. I mean, there's not a single case. And I mean, there's not a single case. There's not a single case over the last 30 years that has been just due process law. No, of course. I mean, like, so as death penalty lawyers, we work with the community. We we, 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 work, we, we work with media. We work with all forms of kind of politicizing and, and, and shaping the case. And, and um, that's right. And, you know, I mean, uh, one of the last cases I work on that worked on that, um, you know, went to execution, but he actually survived the execution after two and a half hours. Um, uh, it, you know, it, I mean, we, 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 it was, it was all about the, it was all about the, the claims, the Eighth Amendment claims and the due process claims of, 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 uh, of cruelty of uh, going after someone who, 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 uh, who was sick and et cetera. But of course, that's, that's, that's the, that's what is, that is the that is the language of the court, but of course that is just a, a small piece of the larger of all of the larger work in terms of dealing with uh, with movements, social movements, uh, with um, uh, with communities, um, which which was the only way that actually we were able uh, to prevail. Yes, it wasn't. We didn't uh, rarely. Was sometimes uh, rarely do we sometimes, but rarely do we prevail on the purely legal argument. So you're right. So thanks for that correction. And, and um, uh, it was an effort to kind of bring back the question of rights, or, or at least say that it's not, comp that, 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 that maybe w the issue is we have to think of these things as strategies, which, which we do. Strategies that, that combine, that work together uh, in different ways. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, so um, I uh, I have uh, Mayaki Kimba is uh, has a question. Do you, can you turn on your um, can you turn your microphone? Yeah. Thank you all uh, for uh, this conversation. Um, and I kind of wanted to return to what uh, Professor Childs mentioned earlier about sort of the investment among historians in specificity and the way in which that can lead to a denial of uh, slavery and its afterlives. And also the importance of centering the epistemological frameworks of the enslaved and incarcerated and dispossessed. And seeing that epistemologies can at times be incommensurable or be in conflict, um, I wonder if there can be a tension between, on the one hand, appreciating the continuities um, and understanding the commonalities, and also at the same time um, engaging with um, the specific epistemologies that people in different times in different places who have been dispossessed or expropriated um, have um, employed. So does this tension exist? And if it exists, um, how can we overcome it? Dennis, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, th thanks for that. And um, well said. And I think dynamic tension is necessary, number one. You know, I, I, I think we should invite it. Um, and I think that that's why I started off with the George Jackson quote, because what he's saying is, is that he feels what the ancestors felt, but more. <laughs> and then he says, I'm left to, to wonder what form the reminder will take. So you know, from plantation to plantation, maybe Stephanie can speak on this. I mean, the the situation of, of enslaved Africans was different, determined by de geography, time, space. Um, so there's unique aspects to, as Dredd was saying, you know, what's going on in Haiti as opposed to here. So I think that holding that notion of a kind of dialectic interface where there's not a, an exact sameness, but there is unique aspects to each 
um, scenario and then listening. You know, Avery Gordon talks about that idea of, you know, in, in, in her book, Ghostly Matters, of a, a politics of real uh, sensitive listening and, and, and being, being open to hearing from those who experience these atrocities and also who are at the, at the forefront of, the re of rebellion against them to the uniqueness of their situation, but also its connection to a broader project which you know, I, you know, I, I use the term the U.S. Um, settler colonial slaveocracy. You know, the question is, when hasn't the U.S. been that? You know, and and and, and that's a rhetorical one. And so, uh, you know, that I, I think that Emory Baraka's notion of the changing same is very helpful there. That is to say, that as things change in form, if you still have this procession of black people being murdered. Uh, under the under the banner of justifi justifiable homicide, and you could connect that all the way back to the 1951 document that I mentioned earlier, and all the way back to you know the 17th century and before. That um, you know recognizing that even as we pay attention to specificity, that there's something at work trying to keep us to think of these atrocities as a kind of pre-modern, pre-capitalist. Uh, modality when they inform uh, everything that we're talking about today in respect to a, a project of depolicing, deincarceration, decolonization. Thank you, thank you, Dennis. Um, does anybody else want to want to add anything uh, on this? Uh, if not, um, uh, I've got two two more questions. I think we have time. Uh, uh, one is from uh, Rebecca Stout, and then one is from Hedwig uh, Liebach. Let's start with you, Rebecca. Can you turn on your video? Thanks. Hi. Yeah, so um, thank you so much for the presentation. I was just hoping to, um, you know, kind of, I, I did the review on the books for this week, and I'd really like to just hear your opinions of all, all of the books put together. So. Um, one of the things that I was most interested in these readings for this week was the discussion of female experience in slavery, whether slaveholding or slave enslaved. Um, and I wonder, um, and, and there was also, you know, a discussion of the archive of slavery and, um, you know, the, the influence of, you know, in, inheritance, you know, inheriting slavery. And so, um, you know, I wonder in, in combination with the discussion on, you know, how we've seen the 13th Amendment influence today, um, you know, in the prison industrial complex, um, you know, are, I would love to hear your opinions on, you know, how, how this experience in the prison industrial complex, you know, today um, and the 13th Amendment might also particularly influence the women um, and women's experiences. So if you could talk about that, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, yes, Stephanie, do you wanna kick us off in the response? That's a really fantastic question. One that, um, you know, I, in my, in, my own, in my own work, what I was really interested in is how, which, which for those of you who don't know um, what it's about, um, I examine um, the economic investments and relationships that white women had um, to slavery, to the institution of slavery from the time that they're young girls, sometimes even infants, until the, until the Emancipation Proclamation, until the Civil War. And so one of the things that I was really interested in trying to work through um, in the book was exactly how women dealt with that transition. Um, the transition from slavery to quote unquote free labor, it, the, the, the individuals who are often centered in those, um, those stories are, are men, are white men. And so I was really interested in how white women, particularly former slave owning women, how they dealt with that transition from enslaved labor to, to, to free labor. And um, I was really interested in whether they kind of relinquished you know, their, the, the control that, that slavery afforded them um, and whether they were willing to just you know, give it up. Um, whether they were willing to embrace more fully um, a system and a 
uh, institution of free labor, and they weren't. Um, they, they in fact were. You know what I what I found was they were very much a part of the development of this system of unfree labor vis-a-vis um, the Thirteenth Amendment, vis-a-vis um, you know the 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 convict leasing system. So they were deeply invested in in acquiring free free labor through um, those those institutions that developed as a consequence of emancipation. Um, so they 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 readily uh, took advantage of uh, the opportunities um, afforded to them by those those new those new features of our society. Um, and so I, I, I'll leave it at that because I know that we are running out of time and, and hopefully someone else will want to say, thing, say something about that. But they were, they were definitely deeply invested in that. And we saw the consequences of that with many, um, many formerly enslaved women being kind of ushered into um, the convict leasing, leasing system and, and into, the, into the carceral state, the early um, burgeoning carceral state um, as a consequence of those, those women's actions too. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on this question? Uh, Maeve? Yeah, I would just um, add that in thinking about this latest exchange vis-a-vis -vis the earlier question about continuities and rights, it seems to me that there's a tension in the reading, because Rebecca, if I heard your question right, it was, you know, how do we think about these readings as a whole? And it seems to me that there's a, a tension in that what we've heard is that when you, you know, get down to the, the granular level and you ask about how these systems reproduce themselves uh, and the ways in which that, uh, that failure to relinquish control that Stephanie just described or uh, Professor Jones Rogers just described, um, how that squares with the story of transformation that now seems so urgent for you know, one strand of abolitionism to today to uncover, right? Which is that how do we think about this uh, layers of continuity in the day-to-day -day material reality of what, what slavery and re-enslavery was vis-a-vis -vis the stories uh, of, of transformation that a certain um, uh, historiography is, is emphasizing for thinking about the reconstruction amendments. And you can see, to think back to Sonia's opening uh, question, um, you know, it reminds me if we think about the abolitionist constitution and on the one hand, how do we square these, uh, these um, layers of sediment that are con con continuous with, you know, a rupture of political change uh, that is getting codified in an amendment when we know that down on the ground level, uh, those, those structures did not change. Uh, so I think it tees up a, a, a question of how we think about these reconstruction amendments and to what extent uh, can we hold that history in the present, even as there's efforts to try to recover a more expansive understanding of the 13th, the 14th Amendment, the enforcement power. Great, thank you, thanks. Uh, all right, and um, we'll take the last question from Hedwig Liebach. Hello, oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much for uh, the talk, it was very fascinating to listen. Um, I think I would have a follow-up question to the question of um, gendered violence and the perpetuation of gendered violence through white women controlling like reproductive um, aspects of black women's lives, their children, the separation of families and so on and so forth. And one of the articles we read for today talked about the um, possibility of theoretical knowledge of this legal framework um, regulating women's bodies, regulating reproduction, regulating like hereditary status, you know, that the like status of slave passed from mother to child and so on. Um, and I was also wondering whether you could briefly, maybe concludingly say something about this aspect of gaining theoretical knowledge through lived experience, because it felt to me as if um, many of your points kind of like hovered around this idea in some sense. Thank you. Dred, do you want to start? Because um, gaining 
theoretical knowledge through lived experience, uh, I think at least it is, is, is something that was central to your, to your work, I think. Yeah, I mean, but I, I, I mean, I, I'll talk about it in the context of my work, but also it is a question of, you know, how, you know, what is knowledge? How is it acquired and who sort of, sort of anoints that knowledge as being worthy of further dialogue or engagement? And, and so, you know, there, the, the, in 1811, specifically talking about this slave rebellion of 1811, the enslaved actually had the most radical vision of freedom and emancipation in the continental US at the time. If one were studying sort of theories of democracy and freedom, mostly what we're told is, well, go read Thomas Jefferson, go read Benjamin Franklin, go read um, you know, uh, Washington and, or, or Locke or Hume or whatever to theorize democracy. But people who were actually living under US democracy, which was, foundation, was founded upon slavery, actually the people who could see very presciently that the problem, you could not get to a just society, a free society, as long as your conception of freedom was predicated upon owning human beings and you have to actually overthrow that system. And so while there is not that much writing of what those people thought, there needs to be more scholarship looking at that and looking at wh where, where is this knowledge? That lived experience actually led Dessalines and, and Louverture to come up with, I mean, you know, it's like they talk about the, the Declaration of the Rights of Man in France, but the, the revolutionaries in, in Saint-Domingue, which became Haiti, actually were able to sort of complete that revolution in a certain sense. And it was only because they were enslaved that they actually had that knowledge and could actually be far more far seeing than the people who were the theoreticians of democracy at that time. And so I think this question, I mean, you know, Dennis has been sort of hammering on, look, if you're talking about abolition work, you gotta talk with prisoners. You can't do this work without the people that were, are currently in prison and formerly incarcerated. You know, I, and so I, I think that, that this thing of experience does actually teach you something, but there is a question of the rational. There is a, a question of stepping outside of your lived experience because just everybody who experienced enslavement or imprisonment doesn't suddenly actually take that to a theoretical level that other people can act on. And so that's you know really important. And so coming back to slave rebellion reenactment, there was a way in which people, the, the people who came together to do this artwork came for all manner of reasons. I talked about, you know, people, a guy who was a prisoner, people who were virtually homeless, people who were activists that were, you know, had family members killed by the police. There were people that were just artists that were, you know, there were all sorts of people who came together and through trying to think about how do we embody this question of freedom and emancipation went on this journey, but then actually living it actually put something into, I mean, things happened during the reenactment that gave us knowledge that we didn't have beforehand. It was both the, the meeting of, you know, colleagues or comrades on the mark, but also the, that we could do this, the actually understanding the strength and resilience of the, the enslaved to be able to do this. And then, you know, where there were similarities with our experience and where there were differences in terms of their resilience and strength and vision. Um, but I, you know, I, I do think there is a way in which you, you, you know, if you live through something, you can actually gain knowledge about it. But the, then the question is, you know, how does that knowledge become, you know, more sort of systematized and, and, and sort of codified in a way that it can be operative and useful for other people. And I don't mean useful in an instrumentalist or utilitarian sense, but, you know, the way in which say Malcolm X took his experience and then, you know, it was doing a lot of read, but it was like his experience in prison synthesized with some of, you know, what was going on in, in the prison at the time, but also with, you know, meeting the nation of Islam that he actually then becomes Malcolm X and then creates an, an analysis and understanding of white supremacy that other people can say, this is the problem. So you can get somebody like Muhammad Ali who can say, look, I'm not going to Vietnam because no Vietnamese ever called me nigger. And it's like, and my problem, my oppressors are right here. Or you get somebody like, you know, George Jackson, who, you know, his life, I mean, from 17 years old, he was in prison. And then he writes two powerful books. I mean, we, I wish we talked even more about Blood in My Eye, because Soledad Brothers is great, but Blood in My Eye is badass, where he's really actually grappling with how do you make revolution in a, in a country like the U.S.? And how do you actually make that meaningful for people who don't expect to live till they're 25? And so that life experience of that was, he was imprisoned on petty shit for his 
whole life as soon as he was, you know, like, you know, able to, to breathe. And then what, what Dennis was talking about is like, look, he felt the connection to the past of enslavement, but it was through being entombed in prisons, you know, that, that then he was able to actually write and correspond with others and connected with the Black Panther Party that could lead to, to uh, actually real ruptures and breakthroughs in, in how people were conceiving of revolution and what that meant and, and how to get free at that point. Uh, Dread that that was uh, that was really that was uh, that was powerful. That was a, that, I think that was a powerful way to, to end our session. Kind of you, you get a, a book ending in a way um, with the with the reenactment artwork and the idea, the central idea here that is emerging, that is merged over the course of our conversation. That it's really it is lived experience may be. Uh, the most threatening, maybe the lived experience may be the most powerful uh, force uh, for for abolition, which in which in part may also be why it is buried, right, and well, and hidden. And it's lived experience uh, and, combined. And, 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 but it's lived experience combined with theory. I mean, George Jackson was reading Mao Zedong. You know, the Panthers were studying other revolutionaries. They were, I mean, it's, you know, the, I mean, I think that lived experience is important, but it does need to get taken to the level of theoretical abstraction. And that's when it, you know, it can become more operative and rich. Yeah, and I, I, I would yeah. just like to add. Or, well, I say, go ahead, Dennis. I would just like to add that just on that point that, you know, the, the, the idea of an epistemology an abolitionist, abolitionist epistemology coming from the belly of the beast is just what Dredd was talking about. It's uh, there is a, a theory, a theorization and a, and a, and a, a kind of tradition or a trajectory of theorizing that goes back to Harriet Jacobs that people like Asada and George Jackson are connected with. Uh, so it's not just, I experienced this and, and just that alone, but at the same time, there there is a an element of, you know, thinking of Frederick Douglass talking about. I know one of your former pal panelists, Derricka, was talking about how much she loved Frederick Douglass, and he was like writing the you know these in, this, these incredible books, three autobiographies, and theorizing and getting you know kind of into the limelight. But at the same time, he says at one point that the songs he heard when he was in, when he was enslaved in Maryland spoke more than volumes of philosophy on the subject of slavery and freedom. And so, you know, there is a way in which the 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 academy uh, and its process of anointing what is theory and what isn't, what is useful for a movement and what isn't, will obfuscate or invisibilize all those modes, you know, that may be kind of with an infrared, you might be able to see when you're in a community that is at siege. You know, there there is a way in which there's a, there is a quality to, you know, things that are not labeled theory that has to do with like the possibilities for black survival and, and, and rebellion as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I, I could not agree more, which is why in part this whole, this whole 1313 series comes under the label of critique and praxis, uh, which is in a sense, uh, the idea of, of theory and praxis and bringing them in confrontation to enrich each other uh, and, to, and to neither privilege uh, theory nor privilege practice, but to, to use them uh, to, to achieve uh, together in confrontation. It's, al it's always a difficult struggle. It's, it's, ne it's never, it's never, theory that is applied it's never practiced that guides theory it's kind of like a constant struggle uh, that uh, ultimately uh, can i think uh, help us to uh, achieve a just society um, so i want to thank you uh, i want to thank you for participating in this rich discussion uh, thank you dread for kind of framing our discussion with your uh, reenactment project thank you so much stephanie and Maeve and Dennis for, uh, for participating and for enriching us all. Um, we, we've spoken a lot about how, knowledge and, uh, and, and what, it, what, what that means. Uh, and I think that this was truly an enriching experience for everyone. Thank you so much. Um, we will return on December 3rd 
uh, for uh, a question about the abolition of property uh, more broadly. And we'll be joined by uh, uh, Amy Allen, uh, Etienne Balibar, Karuna Mentena, and others. So please join us. And again, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for a terrific panel. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Fred. Thanks, thanks, Dennis. Thanks, Maeve. Thanks, Stephanie.